Uh, what happens when you find it? Like what happens when you find your style? And there's some real trappings. There's some real pitfalls with becoming successful. Like, you know, over 30 years, like I found myself getting stuck where um, clients would approach me to kind of keep doing these things that I was kind of tired of doing. And it's like, God, how do I progress? How do I progress as an artist? How do I progress as a designer when like a uh, commercial client's only frame of reference is shit that I've already done or shit that they've already seen? And they just want you to keep like repeating that. And that may not necessarily where you want to be going uh, spiritually or or forward as an artist or designer. And so uh, I think I learned really early that being a master um, had its had its problems. And if I could it and if I could always be the student, if I could always be enthusiastic to fail, then I would just I would keep progressing. And, you know, for me, it's been 30 years and I wake up in the morning and I'm like, holy shit, I still I still love I still love this landscape that I'm wandering through. And I think if uh, if that magic went away, you know, I would just go work at a garden center or something and just sell plants. <laughs> Amazing. At last, I think this has taken us years to do. <laughs> Let's get ready to get crazy! <laughs> <laughs> That's actually the best introduction ever. <laughs> Dude, it has taken us so long to coordinate this. Long. Holy shit. I think, do you th I was thinking today, why is this taking us so long? And I think it's because we're boomers. And because we're boomers. <laughs> I think we're, I think we're both busy, you know, and it's yeah, like, I, I know like there's been some cases where, okay, yeah, let's, let's, let's do it this month. And then all of a sudden I, I book something. It's like, how can we do it next month? And then, <laughs> and then it's like, oh yeah, now I'm, I'm shooting something. I gotta, you know, well, that's good. I mean, I guess that's a good thing. It finally happened though. Finally, <laughs> Here we are. Yeah, we're here. Actually, I've been wanting to have you on the podcast since like the incept so many years ago. Mm. I'm trying to reg I'm trying to remember like my earliest interaction with your work. And I think it was like I was either in high school or very early college. And I thought I saw an interview that you did with Adobe and sure. you were doing this like crazy stuff, especially at that time, too. And we're going to get into all these things. I have all these questions to ask you, of course, but I'm just trying to recollect I was thinking about today, I was trying to meditate on when was the first time I interacted with your work. And I remember that time because I was doing like vector art and you were doing like, it looked like vector art because it had this clean lines, but it was moving and that was dynamic. And I was like, how is this guy doing it? And you were explaining he had all your tattoos. And I was like, mm -hmm. this guy is like fantastic. And <laughs> <laughs> you've been a big inspiration to me and many people I know, but since my like really early career, basically, and it's it's cool to see. It's also been really nice to get to know you as a friend and then extrapolate on that and get to know you as a human being outside of the art, which is really great too. We're going to get into all of these things too, but I just wanted to say like, thank you for just to start off with some gratitude. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's weird when you've been in the space for as long as I have, you know, I am coming up on almost 30 years now, but it, it feels like three minutes, you know? And so people mm -hmm. come up and be like, Oh, I found your work when I was in high school and, you know, I used to look at your tutorials and your open source stuff, and you're the reason why I have the job that I'm doing. I'm like, oh, man, I've only been doing this three minutes. And they're like, no, <laughs> motherfucker, you've been doing this for 30 years. <laughs> so I like that. I mean, we'll, we'll talk a lot about open source and giving back and teaching people, which is obviously a big part of my thing. But yeah, it's awesome when people come up and say like, hey, you know, like I found my career because of some spark or something that you helped me, uh, you know, tune into which is which is awesome but again it's it's this weird it's this weird paradox because yeah it's like when i think about it, it's like okay i've been doing digital art for almost 30 years i'm like holy shit that seems like a long time 
but it doesn't, it, it went by like in a blink of an eye. Like it seems mm-hmm. like just yesterday I, I started working in this space. So it's, it's a weird conundrum for sure. I think this is an outside observer, observer mm-hmm. of you, what you're doing, but I think it's because you've maintained your curiosity and you've evolved with it. And yeah. because of the way you interact with art, it's a little, I think let's actually <clears throat> to articulate this for people that don't know who you are that are new to to understanding who you are. Can you kind of extrapolate who you are and how you interact with art so that they can kind of get a summation? Yeah. I know it's hard to do, but just for the person that is unaware. Yeah. So let's just start with the obsession, which is randomness and chance. Okay. So mm-hmm. we'll, we'll, we'll come back to that in a second. Um, I uh, grew up in Colorado. I was born in San Diego, but my parents moved to Colorado um, when I was pretty young. I actually went to Columbine High School. Uh, that's the school where the two kids came in and shot up mm-hmm. the place. My brother was a senior and was in the lunchroom when that happened. Wow. Uh, I literally I lived that. I lived two <laughs> blocks from that school. So when that whole thing unfolded on national television, I wow. literally could see my backyard from the helicopters that were shooting from up above. So that's oh how close God. I lived to Columbine High School. So I grew up in Littleton, Colorado. Um, and... You know, I won't bore everybody with the crazy details, but like I knew I was going to be an artist like when I was eight or nine years old. Like Mm. uh, this was what I I just enjoyed, you know, making and creating and transporting myself and and others through the act of making weird shit. And uh, which was odd because I didn't have any artists in the family. My dad worked for an aerospace engineer company called Martin Marietta. Like he literally did shit for NASA. And, uh, they, you know, both my parents very early got me into art. And, you know, I think I got my first oil painting set when I was like nine, nine or 10 years old. You know, like, hey, I'll be over here with the turpentine. Like, everything's fine. Uh, You know, this is a breathing out of a rag. Yeah. (laughs) I love art. (laughs) No wonder you've been loving it. Which will be, which will be interesting because we'll obviously talk about sobriety, hopefully at some point. But I mean, that that really was my first drug was inhaling ether out of a, out of a rug. But that's a, that's a whole other side story. Um, Anyway, uh, so get into art and like I entered a statewide painting competition in um, in Colorado for my for my high school. And I took second place in the state of Colorado for painting. And so uh, I literally like I think it was 92, 1992. I literally packed up all my stuff, three boxes and just moved to New York. Like, hey, that's where all the artists are. So I might as well go where, you know, where that whole scene lives. I didn't know anyone. I, I think I slept on floors the first year I lived in New York, um, just kind of floor surf for the, for a year until I got my first apartment. And, you know, just, just thought, well, hey, Andy Warhol, the factory, like this, that's where it goes down. It all goes down in New York. And so I moved to New York in 92, eventually uh, submitted my portfolio to an art school in Brooklyn called Pratt. And at Pratt, you know, listen, taking like life drawing and, and I, you know, studying to be a painter and through a random series of events i find computers and uh what year are we are we yeah this is still yeah this is like 94 95 um i think and Mm. i'm gonna come back to randomness and chance because i was really interested in this idea of like painting a certain way but uh, executing some sort of process that would introduce something that i couldn't control you know, and this this maybe points the tip towards like Matthew Barney, who did um, a whole series called Drawing Restraint, where he would like, you know, restrain himself upside down into a corner where he would, you know, make m- marks under that sort of um, constraint. Right. And so I like this idea of like, hey, you know, how can I make work that has some kind of thing that I can't control? And so I actually did a series of paintings where. Um, I was trying a bunch of things like I would set my canvases on fire. I would like roll them up and I would put them in my freezer. Spoiler alert. They just get cold. Nothing happens. Uh, and <laughs> what happened was, is that I, I started baking my artwork in the oven. And uh, as I was baking my artwork, because I was working in oil paint, it would grow, it would dry faster or slower than the varnish that I was putting on top. And it would cause the paintings to shatter, cause them to explode. And uh, that shattering was like this this random 
naturalistic thing that I could just set the thing in motion and whatever happened happened. And, and, and there was an excitement and a beauty in discovering what I would get. Right. And so on one hand, you had this part of the work that was very controlled where I was like, this is the drawing, this is the painting and I'm making the painting. And then it would have this component of this thing that I couldn't, that I couldn't control. And so when I found computers, it was just, it naturally clicked. I, you know, I think a, a bunch of things happened around 95, 96 that, that really clicked. One was this sort of obsession with randomness and chance. And the second was finding computers. And I was like, oh shit. Like, you know, I remember this moment where I really realized like painting has been around for thousands of years kind of everything has been done and here is this thing here was this like new tool and it was at its infancy and i had this understanding that this thing was only going to get better and the tools were going to get better and it was like um sitting in the ocean on a surfboard and the wave was just starting and it was just like holy shit here we go so um, I'm at Pratt and I'm doing traditional fine art painting stuff, you know, color theory, uh, life drawing, like all the normal shit. And then at nighttime, like I'm taking apart computers and trying to self-teach myself programming. Um, and so I finally, uh, here's the funny bit. So I, I make these, uh, these, these prototype illustrations and I just thought, well, I'm going to, send them to like my favorite book publisher and, and, you know, just like, let them know, like, I'm the, you know, I'm it. I'm like, I'm like the the new and up and coming illustrator. So I sent a bunch of this stuff out to this publisher and they sent me a letter back, like, thanks, but no thanks. <laughs> and I said to a buddy of mine, I was like, man, I'm really devastated. And this is like 95, 1995. I said, I'm really devastated because I just sent this thing to Chronicle Books in San Francisco. And I even still have the letter. It's in my art file where they basically said, like, thanks, but no thanks. So I've got this, like, letter. And I just said, man, I'm really bummed. Like, you know, this, I figured that this was the path. Like, this is the way to go. And this guy goes, man, like, fuck books. Like, book, this is 95, mind you, 1995. And he's like, fuck books, man. He's like, uh, no one's going to read books anymore. There's this whole <laughs> internet thing. And, uh, and that's it. And I'm like, internet? Oh, like, okay. And uh, I end up like reading this like book. I think it was like a 200 page book on like writing HTML and JavaScript for Netscape 2. Oh, and this man. Is, and this is 1995. It was like a easily like a three or 400 page book. I read it from cover to cover. I had no idea what the fuck I had just read. But all the stuff was coming into a place. It was like a like a puzzle falling from the heavens and all the pieces were just kind of like landing. And I could just see this picture that was going to get formed, which is. This wave has just started. The internet has just started. Like these tools are only going to get better. The technology is only going to get better. Um, and you're still going to be a painter. It's just that the weapons have changed. You know, you're no longer going to use brushes and paint and canvas. You're going to be using a computer, but you're going to still, you're still going to be a painter. You're still going to be a painter, but it's going to be with completely different tools. And that was my mindset. My whole mindset was uh, that I was still a painter. and uh, the weapons had just changed, and uh, that thus begins my love affair with with computers back in 1995. Wow, lots to unpack there. I've been taking mm. notes, and my freaking shake spilled all over my my, my keyboard <laughs> while you're going on it. So I was like cleaning it with my sock because I didn't have a, a rag. And, <laughs> and it, here's the crazy thing: like th that we can like sometimes talk about. Here's the crazy thing that that we can talk about, which is, and I don't know when. You, when did you start doing digital art? Like what year? Like concretely, like you felt like, okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna start making shit. Um, I was fascinated with computers since like forever. So I'm an '83 baby, mm. and all the tech. So, I mean, I had my first computer when I was probably like ten. Uh, but I didn't do like digital art then Microsoft or Macintosh at the time had that little, I love those computers. I really want to just buy one and put one in my office. Cause it's one of my favorite designs of all time. The little small one with the, it's like a rectangular shape. The, cube? <laughs> the acrylic one. 
Uh, no, it's it's before oh. that. Not the color ones. Oh, I see. Before you're, that. you're talking about like the two E, like the brown, the yes. all in one brown thing. Yeah, yeah. Jerry yeah. Seinfeld had it in his apartment. <laughs> yeah. <on> Seinfeld. Yeah, <laughs> it's that old. <laughs> yeah. But I would make art in the painting program from there. That's probably the oldest rendition of memory that I have from using yeah. the computer to to establish art as a creation. Not until like probably freshman year in high school, which is late 90s. I graduated 2002, so 1998 or so mm. is when I would publish things on DeviantArt. I think it was around that time. That's when I was like, okay, I did. I took a photo and then I did something weird to it in Photoshop. And this is all very nascent stuff, you know, as you know. Um, yeah. <clears throat> and purely out of the curiosity. I, it, because we, I think we have a lot of similarities where we come from the traditional world. And are in, are uh, wanting to be, you know, satiate our curiosities with art, and it just turns into like, oh well, this is a far superior tool. If you look at it this way, you can do dimensional art, which is oh yeah, the best. <laughs> and it's funny, like I, I remember going back to my high school reunion back in Littleton, Colorado. You know, a bunch of it was like my twenty year high school reunion, and all those people just know me as Josh, you know, the painter. And uh, I remember going back for my 20 year high school reunion and them going like, oh, so, you know, so do you still do art? Do you still paint? I'm like, oh, yeah, you know, I'm an artist, but I, I don't paint anymore. I, I just, you know, I make work with computers now. And there's like a sadness. They're like, oh, like, you know, what? That's such a shame, <laughs> you know, and, and, and in my mind, I'm thinking, no, like the shit that I'm doing far surpasses the human hand. Like I have yeah. transcended painting. Like yeah. why, why, why would I ever want to go back? <laughs> I mean, we're going to get into this. I know, but isn't it odd that the general population has very little to no understanding of how in, and I think that general population will not have perspective on, uh, on any of this stuff until a century past its peak. It's just, just how it goes. Yeah. Think about what art was when the Renaissance before Renaissance was, Think about the the mentality of the mind of the human like society. Basically, the value is sure. Oh, what is what are you doing? You should be farming, or <laughs> you should be building an axe, or you know, you're not providing. You're just what the fuck are you doing? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Before the press, you know, before all these things, it's like I think it's just a sign of that's such a funny thing that because people look at art and they go. Oh, I'm not an artist. I can't draw. And it's like, well, you don't even know what art is then because art is not just drawing, but right. the general population thinks that drawing and being good at drawing and your value as an artist is your craft, yeah. which is kind of true, but this whole thing is unquantifiable, <laughs> which is there, chaotic. <laughs> and it's funny because there's, we've, we've had some <laughs> private discussions about this, you and I, about uh, AI art where you said and 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 this is really you know and I don't real I don't really want to talk about AI too much just cuz I don't I don't really dabble in it that much. <laughs> if you but, want to hear Josh talk about AI, no, listen to Mache's <laughs> podcast. <laughs> yeah, it's true. Art Cafe. True. <laughs> uh but the funny thing is is that you had this like really interesting take on AI where you were like uh imagine all the creative people that now have a tool to get their ideas out. Uh, without yeah. having them having to invest like 10 years in learning cinema 4d yeah and so what's where's the value you know these people are are creative they have ideas they just maybe you know uh just came in late and don't have the time to invest you know 15 or or 20 plus years into learning you know all of the products and and to help so are they any less creative than yeah, they're they, yeah they suck. And they're horrible people. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> I love them. No, actually, Craig Mullins mentioned this. The great Craig Mullins on the podcast I did with him, and I thought it was such a wonderful way of looking at it. He just said, "Everybody, I, th I don't know. I'm paraphrasing what he said, but this similar along the lines. He says people are looking for the right module, and you you connect them with the right module that unlocks them. And I think the AI thing does <clears throat> potentially unlock a lot of people." It unlocks mm. their their ability to go, but at the same time, I will say the human journey for me personally is the struggle and the perseverance. You know, mm. we've talked about this. Your style is every failure you've overcome. That's yeah. your style, and there's something to be said about the investment of time into a craft, and people can valid validate that or value that for, to whatever 
you know, mm -hmm. and we can talk about that with NFTs and attributing value to sure. digital creation because this is an important part of our livelihood and our lives. But yeah, I mean, also think about people that are, you know, um, blind or people that <laughs> can't draw, but were victimized and they can use this as a method to convey it. You know, oh, the, the person looked like this, like this. So these are the attributes. Oh, it's actually that. So it's almost like allowing the mind to open itself up to a whole nother level. And when you, when you reduce, when you remove our human insecurities, because like we're clinging to a raft of, you know, scavenged memories. Mm -hmm. <laughs> don't, don't take me away. Then the, the tidal wave of AI is just smashing everybody away. It's, you know, we talked about that too. It's doing two things at once. It's killing and giving birth at the same time. So, sure. yeah. And every day we, you know, we talked about it at length too. It's like just same with the AF NFT thing. It's like every day is a, is another sh volatile shift in how our perspective shifts based on what input we're getting. Right. But it's something to talk about, <laughs> but yeah, no, it's, it's, that's a whole nother journey. What's really cool. So if we talk about <clears throat> going back mm. to this curiosity that you have, and then yeah, I love this failure of saying, Hey, I'm the shit. I'm going to do this book. And then <laughs> this wizard comes into your life, says that ah, books are bullshit. <laughs> yeah. As I have a bunch <laughs> behind me. <laughs> I love my books. But, and I've yeah, gotten rid of all of mine. <laughs> <laughs> I know you just got a bunch of sex toys back there or something. It's <laughs> true. true. My, my studio used to look like yours. I actually moved uh, my, uh, first of all, you have to understand, I, I, I live just on the outskirts of New York Yeah. and my house my property is from 1896 mm. and they had built wow. a, a house and a barn and the barn was from 1896. The house was from 1896. And then wow. they knocked down the house in 1912 and built our house, a, a second house in 1912. We're the second owners. It's been in the same family for like over a hundred years. And wow. so my house is like 50 feet that way. So I'm literally in a barn from 1896. So it's funny. It's That's like so cool. on the outside, it looks like this old ass barn. And when you come inside, yeah. it looks like a radio shack blew up. Um, <laughs> it's insane. Uh, so, most people don't know what radio shack is. Can you explain that? Oh yeah. <laughs> it looks like an electronic <laughs> shore, uh, electronic store. What's um, that? We only use Amazon. Just, yeah, exactly. exactly. <laughs> it looks like Man, an radio Amazon shack? technology oh, fulfillment center. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but so I've got this, I've got two stories, right? And mm. my studio looked a lot like yours where I, you know, I had books and, and magazines and comics and, and the th and the truth of the matter is, is I would walk in this front door and I would I would come in and I would just see this wall of of I don't want to say old things, but just yeah. objects. And, yeah. you know, maybe I would look at a book once. Maybe I'd look at a magazine twice and it would just sit on the shelf. And so and it's funny because I kept making all these trips upstairs to get like the shit that I needed, mm -hmm. you know, and. So I was like, you know, I, I'm going to make a, I'm going to make a change. I'm going to take all this stuff that maybe is memorable or I'm connected to in some, some way, but I'm really going to move it upstairs and all the stuff that I need to be creative, I'm going to move downstairs. Mm -hmm. And so I got this, you know, system where I got, you know, a hundred of these bins and like, I'll just read, um, one says leap motion, one says Arduino, one says resistors and transistors, buttons and sensors, clips and clamps, electrical tape, conductive wire, um, HDMI, SDMI, uh, SDI, splitters, uh, there's connect and there's uh, lasers and like it's yeah. all the stuff. <laughs> I that can tell the... you really like it because you're listed out way too many things. Like <laughs> yeah, I only listed like a quarter. I, I only listed I like a quarter of it. I was like, I think he's going to keep going. I'm yeah, just going to let but, him name them all. <laughs> yeah. But the cool part of it is, is that like, this is all the stuff that can be like a key to something. Mm. And so like when I walk in that front door now, this mm. entire wall of things is like, okay, motherfucker, like what are we making today? Like potential, <laughs> potential yeah. is here. And mm. so there's always this kind of, because you mm. made a mention of this, like creative curiosity, like there's always this moment that this, at the second I enter my door, I'm flooded by what can be. 
not what's done, mm -hmm. not what's completed and not what's finished and not what's printed in a book and kind of in its final form. It's all the raw things that can awaken the mind. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, every time I walk into this space, I'm like, oh yeah, okay, all right, we're going to do something. Like, <laughs> you know, like mm -hmm. we're going to kick ass and take names. And so it's really changed the way, like I think, because mm -hmm. I'm- Love that. I think environment's very important. And I think the environment is conducive to, to potential and what can be rather than the finished form. And mm. those books and those magazines always kind of represented the finished form. Mm. And uh, it's, it's funny because a couple of things, I, I ended up giving a talk at um, 99U, which is kind of like, like Ted ish. And uh, this was like a couple is years ago. Is that what back. it's called? Is that their theme? Yeah, thing? it's, it's, it's like, kind of like Ted. It's Ted ish. <laughs> but it's more like, you know, around art and design because it was, it was put on by Behance. So oh, it, it's Artsy Ted. Yeah. Yeah, it's Artsy Ted. Right. <laughs> less, yeah, less 99U is, is less uh, doctors, less scientists. It's Scott yeah. Belsky and Behance. It was That's kind right. of, yeah. it was their, like, you know, their, their conference. Well, anyway, <laughs> one year they threw it at um, Radio City Music Hall, I think is. I thought you were going to say Radio Shack. I was like, dude, come on. No, not Radio City <laughs> Music Hall. Uh, um, Lincoln Center. They threw it mm. at Lincoln Center. And uh, that, that you can see that video on YouTube. Uh, and there's a couple of funny things that I thought you would get a kick out of. I start the conference with uh, a mm. buddy of mine because I'm at Lincoln Center, right? Oh, you do it with your bud? And a buddy of mine says... Uh, <laughs> Yeah, I was hanging out with a comedian friend of mine and uh, he was, you know, out on the streets of New York and he gets approached by these tourists and these tourists like have this map open and, and they say, uh, uh, do you know how to get to Lincoln Center? And my buddy without a thought says, yeah, a shit ton of hard work. <laughs> And so it was like <laughs> it was like this perfect metaphor. It's like, oh, my God, I'm like performing at Lincoln Center, you know. And, you know, my buddy had this thing happen to him where, you know, oh, a shit ton of hard work. And it really made me think like, you know, I, it, this kind of goes back to what you were just asking earlier, which is. Uh, I think uh, both of us have done a shit ton of hard work. <laughs> you know what I mean? Or even like Mike, like people, I think, wonder like, oh, why, why, why people. Mike? Why, why people? A shit ton of hard work. Right. You know, and I and I think uh, we've put in the amount of hours and failures and failures and failures to really kind of hone out what those like uh, successes are. Right. And um, so I'm giving a talk at at Lincoln Center for this 99 U. And the whole premise of that talk was called escaping success, which is this idea that you know, like when you're first starting out, you're trying to find your voice, you're trying to find your style, you're trying to find that thing that sort of excites you about, you know, making work. Like, why do I get up every day? And, you know, am I making the things that I love? And uh, what happens when you find it? Like, what happens when you find your style? And there's some real trappings. There's some real pitfalls with becoming successful. Like, <laughs> you know, over 30 years, like I found myself getting stuck where, um, clients would approach me to kind of keep doing these things that I was kind of tired of doing. And it's like, <laughs> God, how do I progress? How do I progress as an artist? How do I progress as a designer when like a uh, commercial clients only frame of reference is shit that I've already done or shit that they've already seen. And they yeah. just want you to keep like repeating that. And that may not necessarily where you want to be going uh, spiritually or, or forward as an artist or designer. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, I think I learned really early that being a master um, had its had its problems. And if I could <laughs> it, and if I could always be the student, if I could always be enthusiastic to fail, mm. then I would just I would keep progressing. And, you know, for me, it's been 30 years and I wake up in the morning and I'm like, holy shit, I still I still love. I still love this landscape that I'm wandering through. And I think mm. if, uh, if that magic went away, you know, I would just go work at a garden center or something and just <laughs> sell plants. 
This is inspiring. I appreciate that. It's, I didn't even think about it. I looked as I look at books and I still do as like friends, you know, that give me value. But when you mentioned it, I haven't, when I look around on my bookshelves, it's almost like I, I collected all of these books because there was a stage in my life where I was <laughs> rapidly going through a lot of data and extrapolating and the internet didn't have enough dynamics like the books did. They didn't, they didn't have as much depth. The internet's gotten better since then, but I still think there's some value in books, but I have recently converted my entire library and all of my books, almost all of them into a Kindle. So I have like mm. 500 books in here and I just read constantly because I love reading and that's been transformative. And then when I look around the room, yeah, I don't use these things that much and they are kind of relics of a past version of myself and they are the finished version of something. It's yeah. unfair. Not all of them. Some of them are, you know, they go into depth of the process of making things, but the incessant, the continual student is definitely a mindset that I appreciate and it's something that I don't know. I mean, I've been, I think we've all been stricken by this and there's no way in my life that I feel like I'm going to acquire mastery, but I'm, I'm striving for it. But at every time you hit those those plateaus of growth where you don't want to sure. fail because you have a repetition of success. Yeah. And it's really <clears throat> scary. Yeah, well especially if if it's not just like, hey, I'm I'm going to do this privately and it's not going to it's not going to affect if I can feed my family. Right. <laughs> but the moment you start saying, okay, well, this is my life and it's public and I'm also going to be like contributing to like maintaining my family then you're like okay well, this, is, this is very dynamic and it's very yeah. complicated <laughs> i mean i yeah. i went through it about 15 years into my career like 15 mm. years into my career not only did i feel like i really hit a ceiling emotionally and creativity creatively mm. but the software company that owned the product that i worked in killed the product <laughs> so wow. like all of a sudden like the rug was just being pulled out from under me and i was like oh shit I have to start over with mm. something else and some other tool set. And what if I fail? Mm. And so there was like, there was like this really scary moment where like 15 years into my career, I just turned 180 degrees and walked away from everything that had given me success and, mm. and financial security. And it wow. was like, well, got to start over. Fuck. Um, That's interesting. Cause I'm coming up on a, like, I think about a 15 year in the mm. film industry. And now the AI thing is happening. So there's a little bit of a mirror there. And I'm like, well, shit. <laughs> yeah, it's a paradigm shift. And Here, here's the thing, man. As soon as I saw that you posted like spending some time on Unreal, I was like, Ash is going to be fine. <laughs> <laughs> Ash is going to be just fine. <laughs> oh, thank you. Well, I mean, you know, it's it's a constant evolution. And these are all forms of language. That's what I look at. Each program is a language, basically. And the way that we interact with them is how good are you at speaking Cantonese and can you get around the country? You know, how good yeah. are you at speaking Cinema 4D and can you get around the program? Because the whole time the program is there with all of the power that you want to give it. But you have to have the the wherewithal and like, as you mentioned, a shit ton of hard work. Yeah. We don't just fall ass backwards into these results. It's a lot of like, okay, I'm going to go left. Ah, fuck. Yeah, I'm stuck. I'm going to go backwards. And I'm going to go right. Okay. A little bit less than left, but it's a little bit better. And you just constantly ones and zeros as a human brain. You're just kind of failing through success. Because I was doing a bunch of renders last night with Carlos, my buddy, who I do the the car renderings with and i was mm -hmm. thinking to myself i was looking at them i was like fuck man this is getting really good and i'm getting to the point where it's happening at like pretty fast speed and i thought man i have to take stock in these things I'm, I'm, i imagine you do as well but you have to take a minute and take stock and be like man i've come i've come some distance already you know like yeah. not to say that i that i've arrived where i want but it's sometimes it's really important just as important as the thing is like okay I'm getting, I'm, I'm heading in the right direction, you know? Yeah. <laughs> I think the, I, there's a lot of fumbling, I think in the beginning yeah. and usually it's, it, yeah. it's the fumbling has to do with, you have a, a, a mental picture in your mind yeah. of something that you would like to see come into fruition, but you may lack the tools yeah. in order to fully realize that idea. Yeah. And so yeah. 
okay, cool. There's this like landscape. There's this thing that I'm tr- that, that I'm trying to get like transported to, but you know, my skill set is is limited in a way where it doesn't quite get to Nirvana. <laughs> and then and then there's this moment where, um, and again, this just is a shit ton of hard work. And after 30 years, like I've gotten to the point where it's like I have this idea in my mind, and then I start writing code. And then I hit compile and it comes out exactly as that I intended. Wow. And there's this like, wow. Oh yeah. Like That's some power right there. There's this connection between, there's a synthesis between uh, the expected outcome mm. and then mastery of the tools to execute said, uh, said vision. Yeah. And that's pretty, it's pretty magical. But again, it's also like pretty scary <laughs> because uh-huh. I always want to, I, I just want to make sure that I always keep moving the goalpost, you know? Yeah. So there's this idea of like, okay, you know, I've got goals. There's, I want to get good at doing X, Y, and Z and X, Y, and Z is labeled on this goalpost. And then it's like, as soon as you start to get close to making the goal, I want to push back the goalpost like another 50 yard. As you and should. It, Consummate it's, been, student. it's been 30 years of doing that. And I think as long as you keep doing that, then the 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 pool of knowledge and the sandbox of utility just gets bigger and bigger mm. and bigger. And then that not only means that, you know, not only are you able to fully execute the ideas that you have in your mind, but then you get surprised because then mm. all of a sudden you do things and you're like, holy fuck, like I didn't think it was going to do that. And then it starts this branch. And I'm really interested in these ideas of exploring branches and mutations and uh yeah. 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 I love it. <laughs> I'm so happy we're doing this. This is wonderful. I've already get, got, like gathered so many interesting things for us to tangent off of. I, love... I swear to God, the next podcast, if all your books are gone, I'll know it's my fault. <laughs> yeah, your fault is actually really great. I mean, I don't know. I, I, you know, I've had this thing in my life where I grew up with not a lot and it it, it brews insecurities and you have this weird attachment to things and money. You have this weird, it's a feared based kind of reaction Mm. and interaction. And the older I get and the more comfortable I get with certain things and and more of that voice gets quelled away, I realize, Hmm, well then really, who am I? If I can release that fear and be like, that's not your, that's not your identity. That's your false ego or whatever it might be. Then who really truly, who are you? And, And then, do these things have core value? I remember one of the things that I wanted to do was own a supercar and I wanted to do it by making art. I wanted to prove it to myself that I can be a kid that comes from low priority in the world's economy. (laughs) Yeah. You know, and then acquire enough wealth in order to acquire something that's a beautiful work of art. Now, you know, I love cars. And so Mm -hmm. I did. And then that thing started to own me. I couldn't enjoy it. And right. then the moment I got rid of it and I turned it into something that I could actually use and turn it into a memory machine, I was like, oh shit, I yeah. think this is who I am. But you, I had to go through that. The of being. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. You, you had turned me on to a, one of my favorite books of all time, which I, I still frequent maybe once every couple of years or so, The Fountainhead. And oh my God. Yeah. Listen, I, I posted a quote. I got yeah. into a bit of trouble on, on the internet because I, I, <laughs> you? I, no. I, uh, I, I said something in like, say? hey, well, I mean, it, it's an interesting conversation. The and, and this comes from the Fountainhead, a passage, you know, specifically in the Fountainhead. Oh, I know what but, you're uh, talking about. I, I think the, I can guess which one. Yeah. Yeah. So. The the thing I said was, is that, you know, and again, I navigate the waters of generative art and I've been navigating the, the, the waters of generative art for again, almost 30 years now, like yeah. writing, make, making programs. God, we never really talked about what I do. I yeah. write programs that generate <laughs> artwork. There we go. Okay, cool. It's done. Uh, That's actually and been, a good distillation. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I write shit that makes shit. Uh, and I've been doing that now for about 30 years. And I, I, and obviously this this has an attachment to nfts and and we'll we'll maybe touch on that a, a mm. little bit mm. but i just didn't understand why people felt the need to make generative art look like something else so there's this trend where people want to make generative art look like pencil or make look paint or make it look like marker mm. and i it just sort of baffled me because i was like well why i mean the the computer 
I get is a why. tool. It's a medium. Like why, why is there this They're uh, trying to bridge the gap between the people that back in Colorado, there were sad that you weren't a painter. They, the yeah, way but they see, can, but, they the, but there's a look. Yeah, but there's a bit of sadness around that. Oh, so why I, there's so a sadness why, on the sadness? <laughs> yeah. So why assign value because something yeah. looks like a painting? Because I, then somebody I agree. can because then somebody you. can look at this digital art and go, oh, that looks like a painting. Well, painting's hard, so this must be hard. Thus, then it then has value. Yes. And yes. so that's why they do I, it. So I'm just saying, like, hey, all I said was, is you know, you don't need to make digital art look like another medium in order for it to be valuable or it to have value or for it to be successful. And, yeah. and part of me was kind of like pointing the finger at collectors, like saying like, <laughs> this isn't any more important just because it looks like it was made with crayon. Like anyway. Mm. And so I just made this like very blanket statement and actually comes from the fountainhead where um, mm. Howard Rourke, you know, questions why the, the Parthenon is, is a great building mm. and why did he make the columns the way he did? And, and it's this, it's really this like beautiful moment of, of describing really the birth of, of modern architecture, this, mm. this disconnect from why are we doing the things that we're doing and what, what is possible in space environment and tools of that moment. And so, mm. you know, there it's, it's, it's slightly rumored that the book is, is about Frank Lloyd Wright. Um, I could see that. But after, after making that comment, I, I, I found out two things. One is people really hate Ayn Rand. And two, Why? people really fucking hate Ayn Rand. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> like, uh, I don't know. You know, uh, yeah. yeah. So anyway. Why? Um, I, mean, I don't know. I, I honestly don't know. And, and I just was so like. so fantastic. It, it made me feel less like an alien in the world. It truly did. I, I, think I went through have... life thinking like I'm an alien. This is weird. The way I mm. look at things is totally fucking weird. And. I don't fit here amongst anybody and yeah. and people saying I'm a dick or an asshole or, you know, this and that, and tr probably true. But at the same time, my stubbornness and my unwillingness to shift the, the intention is ego based and it has gotten me in a lot of trouble, but it also has led me to some very interesting places in my life where I can be proud mm. of the past yeah. rather than be like, I sacrificed and didn't listen to my inner voice and, now I'm right. just a puppet listening to and, everybody else's fucking words. And here, here's, <laughs> the, here's the beautiful thing I think about that book. If you really distill it down to this idea, um, Howard Rourke isn't the, the hero. He's not the, he's not the winner. In mm -hmm. fact, if anything, Peter Keating is probably way more successful mm -hmm. because he acquiesces to the client's wants and needs. He sacrifices self in order to uh, do whatever the client wants. And so what suffers is artistic truth. So how Howard Rourke really is the end. Like, Depends on how you look at it. Yeah. You can, yeah. I mean, you he's, really the, those sides, you he's really the, he's really the impossible character and he's probably yeah. hated. Yeah. You know, yeah. well throughout that one, I mean, definitely despised and hated and yeah. made, a, made a fool of you know but and so it just it's made, like it's like this is the thing i don't think about you it's like oh man uh, i was like <laughs> yeah now that, that line i was just like oh yeah now that we're alone now and no one's listening you can finally tell me what you think about me yeah but i don't think about you yes. <laughs> it's such a brilliant line <laughs> um and so there's so there's brilliant. something there's such something like very pure and impossible about Har howard Rourke, which is mm -hmm. you know he's it's like, a true artist without uh, bounds, basically. Yeah, like non-compromising, like just self-truth. And, yeah. and in a lot of ways, it's like, if I can, you know, listen to that voice and like, hey, let me give you a perfect example. Um, in, in past years, I used to do a lot of um, uh, portfolio reviews, like at colleges, you know, like I'd get flown out and- That's tough and, to do. Um, you would you would look at a uh, student's work and and the amazing thing is I remember this one time I'm in like either St. Louis or Louisiana as one of those places and I'm reviewing a portfolio and this 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 kid puts this portfolio down and I have to tell you Ash the first three pages were incredible they were like definitely this obsession with type and it was kind of like a, a, a twist on a David Carson it had like good good movement and good structure. 
And then you turn the page and it was like uh, a website for, um, you know, like how to, to, to combat uh, poverty in, in Africa. And you just look at this thing and you're just like, wait, I was like, man, this is so weird to go from like these first three pages to something like this jarring disconnect. So I just said, so what, what is, what is this right here? Oh, well, that was a project that our, our, our teacher gave us, you know, that we had to build like a mock website for a charity about, you know, solving something in, in third world country. Right. And I said, okay. Okay. And, uh, I was like, great. Uh, you're hired. And he goes, what? And I said, you're hired. I, I want you to do this for the rest of your life. And you could just see like nice. the, 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 blood, the blood, like rush out of his face. He's like, wait, he's like, yeah, but I, I don't want to do that. And then I was like, well, why the fuck is it in your portfolio then? Yeah. Like, you know, <laughs> and, and it done. led, and it led me to, to, to understand this like truth, which is like the type of work you make mm. is the type of work you get hired to do. Oh yeah. So it's always probably a pretty good idea to love the work that you're making. Always. And yeah, so definitely you and never show like, the work you don't love or proud of, unfortunately. And that's a very Howard Rourke thing. That's a very <laughs> fountainhead thing, which is like yeah. staying true to the intent, the sovereignty, the intent, mm. the intent, sovereignty to soul, the intent. Yeah. Now there's probably people that yeah, will make for a everybody. lot. No, there. And, and the funny thing is, is that I remember once I, uh, I, I was in Portugal and uh, I was I was there with Stefan Sagmeister and uh, we ended up going to lunch. And uh, I just said to Stefan, because you know, Stefan's been in the business for like a long time. And I Very just said, Stefan, yeah, I just said, Stefan, like, I Peter. got a question for you. He's a Peter. Uh, <laughs> like I'm on stage and I'm looking at all these people and like sometimes like I look down and I see somebody wearing like Prada and they've got like a Louis Vuitton bag or whatever. And I was like, hmm. and I said, I, I think the people in the audience make more money than I do. And he goes, <laughs> and he goes, yeah, th th they do. <laughs> and I went, what? And he goes, oh yeah, they make a lot. They make a, a shit ton more money than you. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, but I'm, I'm there as the speaker. And he goes, yeah, 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 yeah. But th they're, they're going to make easily like, you know, 10 times more, more money than you. And I was like, well, well, how do I get rich? <laughs> he goes, <laughs> and he goes, Stop uh, doing he what goes, you're doing. <laughs> yeah. He goes, he goes, here's the thing, Josh. He goes, here's the thing. And I'm paraphrasing, you know, sure, so sure. Stefan sees this, I'm paraphrasing. Yeah. <laughs> but the, the idea was, is that, um, he's like, but those people are unhappy. You mm. know, they probably work for some big agency and they probably, they, they, you know, for four years, all they work on is Nike or all they work on is Coke and, or all they work on is Pepsi. And they've been doing that for four years and they're really unhappy. And he's like, um, so you've got to make a choice. You can do the type of work that you want to make mm. and you probably won't make as much money, but you'll be infinitely happier than everyone else. Mm -hmm. And I was like, maybe. Yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I was yeah. like, all right. <laughs> you know, maybe, maybe Hit that's the, the path. Word bomb. Yeah. But maybe that's the path I want to go. You know, it's like, mm -hmm. I think I had this like preconceived notion, like, oh, okay. After I've been in this business for, you know, 10 years, I'm supposed to start a studio and I'm supposed to start getting employees. And you could, and then all of you a sudden be I extremely become unhappy and just I become the babysitter people. of other creative people. <laughs> Basically you're wiping everybody's creative butts. Yeah. No. Yeah. That never and looked so, appealing to me. I already saw no. the writing on the wall. I was like, uh, uh, no way, man, because I work so fucking hard. And if I'm on full blast, I mean, good luck keeping up with me. And I don't think it's fair for me to expect mm. that in other people. And I, I, I love, that right I away. It's funny. I read this thing, I think last week that just said, um, as an independent creative, I work 80 hours a week <laughs> so that I don't have to work 40 hours a week for someone else. <laughs> yeah. I mean, also on top of that is like last week I, or a couple of weeks ago, I went out and just like drove my friend's car in the desert. And then I went to LA and like saw a friend and it's like, and I went to lunch and I'm like, I could never do this if I was working. If I once you take control of your own life, it's very stressful and it's, it's, you're the only one to blame, but you have so much more currency of freedom and that currency of freedom. It's like, I knew it instantly. The moment I was like, I can't, mm. I can't have a boss. I don't like to respond to people. And this is like when I never, yeah. I didn't read Fountainhead until like, like two years ago or something. So I was like 38. Yeah. So f fucking 38 years of my life going like, what is wrong with me? Why am I such a weirdo? 
<laughs> you know, why can't I just have a nine to five? And why can't I just work for somebody and be happy? I tell you, the worst parts, the most depressing parts of my life was just having to be a yes man and saying and dealing with what other people wanted of me. And I was like, I just, mm -hmm. I don't know how to explain this, but this isn't for me as much as I want to be able to do that and do that for you. I just can't. And when I, when I, I would say, I think that there's definitely some negatives, obviously, like Howard, I think, although with intention, I know we didn't mean to dissect this as a podcast about that book, but anybody that's listening to this, I don't give a fuck what anybody says. That book is fucking amazing. And I changed my life in a lot of ways. It gave me a lot of, of core, like reminder, like, no, like, you're on the right path. It's hard and it sucks. And everybody's going to look at you in this way, but it doesn't matter. <laughs> follow right. that, follow that bliss. And this is the answer to it. And the harder push people push back, the more you need to push in, you know, we can only judge the future. Like we see we look at a lot of things like say like the impact that Elon has on society. We look at it with the lens of the current now, but we don't see it in the perspective of a century from now and go like, damn, that guy was firing off on all cylinders, doing all kinds of weird shit. We can say that about Henry Ford because we look at it from the past. We forgive a lot right. of the shortfalls, you know, and, and the pitfalls that he, I mean, True. that guy was controversial. You got to think about it. That, that, that human being shifted the zeitgeist of humanity on a lot of ways. And that's just yeah. one person. So, you know, I don't know. These are things that I, cause I love history and I love researching it cause it's like, History repeats itself. You see certain patterns and then we're kind of simple creatures as much as everybody thinks we're snowflakes. It's not the case. We're all pretty much the same in a lot of ways, <laughs> but it's fascinating. So I wanted to thank you because that book, you're like, have you read this book? And I was like, no, I was like, you need to read this book up because it says, I think this was when we were doing, we were doing the Christie's auction together. It was me, you and, and Bradley G monk, G monk, G, G mizzle dude. I just roomied with him at our basil and it was, <laughs> absolutely amazing i love him so much and like we had no business having like being roommates in the in the hotel room but we're like we had all the business to do that because we were just had so much fun being little kids and like full on so i just and he always his energy unlocks like the child in me and i just like become a full-on like 10 year old <laughs> i have to tell you the first time i met g monk uh so he was working at virtual in dc and this maybe was like 99. His 99, career is just so big. My God. 99 or 2000 <laughs> or something like that. And so a bunch of those kids that worked for virtual uh, came up from DC and visited me uh, at Kyokin, which I worked at Kyokin. It was like this uh, studio of maybe about eight people. And we were just really hitting on all cylinders uh, in the web space and, and, and the flash space. So they all came up to like, you know, hang out with me and, and meet me. Not Bradley. Uh, Bradley, I, I don't know if he knew who I was or or just didn't care. <laughs> what and year I is remember, this? Can you track this? Yeah, back? it's it's, it's got to be like 1999 or 2000. Mm -hmm. And he's sitting in the corner, like eating Vegemite and like doing like rubber band like workouts or whatever. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, like something came up, and I was like, "Oh, Matt Owens," and blah blah blah. And he goes, "You you know Matt Owens?" And he like all of a sudden like lasered to me, and he's like, "You know you you know I want to meet Matt Owens. You know Matt Owens? Like I, I've always wanted." And like, yeah, 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 yeah. We both live in Brooklyn, and and G Monk was just like wanted to meet this other dude, and I was just like, "Well, okay." And then it's it's just it's hilarious that we obviously become <laughs> like really good friends. <laughs> but he was a sketcher. Oh my god. Yeah. Such a sketcher. <laughs> what do you mean by sketcher? Just like, uh, like <coughs> my first impressions of G Monk is, is like this guy is standing on a precipice and he could just fall over into the, to the void at any moment. <laughs> like you just never quite know if he's just going to snap and just like fall off into space. Fatherhood's or changed he, him. Or he could just, or that. he could just, oh yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. yeah that's yeah. a whole, that's another discussion. But at the time. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. G-Monk was just pre -daddy, always at the. Pre-Daddy yeah. G was a whole nother beast. Yeah. G-Monk was <laughs> either like on planet earth or communing with crystal aliens. You just didn't know. <laughs> you just didn't know with Bradley. <laughs> It's uh, just an, an uncertainty. I love of, that, of that of that boy. Oh, he's great. He's I love. I, I really do love all of our friends in this group. Um, sometimes, you know, I think you know this about me. I get kind of walled in in my routines, and I get stuck in these things, and I just kind of mm. 
hermit out, hermit up, you know, that's why yeah. I, the podcast has been a savior for my mental health <laughs> for all these years. But, sure. uh, but whenever I get a chance to be with you guys and, and especially, and obviously always in person, I'm just like, fuck yeah, man, I'm so there's blessed. A lot to, of, there's a lot of squeezing. A lot of squeezing and <laughs> I'm very physical and most people aren't. And yeah. Josh isn't one of those and he gets a lot of man hugs from me. <laughs> this is true. <laughs> and a lot of people think I'm short because of the pod, like the way that this no. angles. No, I'm six yeah. two. No. I'm not a small yeah. guy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So when people meet me like, what the hell? <laughs> I'm like, you're getting a hug. <laughs> That's right. I accept your personal love language. <laughs> There's no choice in the matter, <laughs> especially when we get together too. And I've been drinking a little bit because I know you're sober. And then I'm just like, yeah, oh, well, I don't do this much. So I might Bring as well soak in. it up. Yeah. yeah. The last time I saw you, I think was Barcelona. I was there with my wife and yeah, there was a lot of hugs. Yeah. Yeah. We were true. off. We were speaking at off. Together. I was trying to think, I thought maybe Beeple's opening was the last thing, but no, you're right. We, we, we ended up powwowing in, uh, in Barcelona. I forgot about that. Yeah. Before that was New York, right? At the... Did we meet at, you know, oh yeah, there was a Christie thing, Christy's and thing, then yeah. and then Mike's and Mike's opening. That's right. Yeah. We should talk about three letters. But here's that the funny thing: I just want I wanted to comment on one thing that you said, which is <laughs> this is a very lonely endeavor. Yeah, it's very lonely. It, very like selfish. Think, very lonely. When I, yeah. which is such an odd thing because it's like you're sitting in a room by yourself. Yeah. You're it's very creating masturbatory. work. You're creating work by yourself, mm. and then you literally you are like throwing it out into the void and. Do people see it? Do people not see it? Like you just don't know. And then all of a yeah. sudden, it's not until you get out of this environment, right? And we're just huh. hanging out, and you're like, "Oh yeah, man. Hey, Ash, I saw your la you know last movie, and holy shit! It like, trips me I out have, that you even I have seen questions, anything. I have thoughts, and I have this, and I <laughs> I bought the Lost Boys T-shirt, and then it's like all of a sudden, all of a sudden, it like it comes rushing back about this like loneliness, this loneliness mm. of sitting in this room and sort of just like vomiting into the, into the void. Uh, <laughs> do you like it? I feel like you like it. That's your zone, right? You, you'd prefer to do this or would you yeah. prefer, I know, I know you had a project that was, that incorporated a lot more people, more social activities, but I like, what's your I happiest like, day? Like if you had one more day to live, what would it look like? Oh, uh, it would just be me here in the studio playing music and it would be at four in the morning. Hmm. Uh, there's, there's something I'm a night owl and yeah. I love this idea always been that a night owl? it's, yeah, I am not a morning person. Hmm. I love this idea of like, of a stillness sort of like across the city and like this idea of like, everyone is asleep. And while everyone is asleep, like I am this, uh, you know, mad scientist that's, that's hatching up uh you know weird shit <laughs> and then i i put it out and then and then as the sun rises people drug. are then experiencing the thing that like it magically happened you know at nighttime <laughs> so like yeah santa claus <laughs> I, I love this i love this like the perfect the 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 perfect day for me would be yes like four in the morning mm. just hypnotized because mm. i obviously do you i have like sessions code. where you go like you, do you know that we're in that we're in that really starts to peak for you is it like a two hour a three hour a four hour cycle until you you had nothing curiosity you start to dive in you start to construct oh, yeah. and then is it a three and hour then, do you know and then it becomes like meditation like yeah, i literally yeah. there's no self i literally vanish yeah there's there's times where i'm just like writing code <laughs> and then and then sometimes like i feel like i'm inside of my body like disconnected from it <laughs> Like looking through the eyes and inside I'm going, holy shit, like I'm really doing something here. And my body just like a, like mm. automatic is just like writing stuff, writing stuff, writing stuff. And mm. it's this weird transcendent meditation where I'm here, but not here. Mm. Fucking magical, bro. Yeah. Magical. There's not many people on the planet that can experience that, I think, because it takes a significant amount of self love and self-hate <laughs> and also like trying to satiate the curiosities but there is this weird thing that i think happens it's almost like a like you mentioned the word meditation i think it is it's almost like a cycle it's like and you're breathing and you're in it and those yep. that are listening that know this it's a deep intimacy that you have with yourself and it's it's kind of awesome i realized that what was happening too is i would do a lot of false storytelling in my head and i would stimulate like bad stories and i'm like oh no 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 and i started to catastrophize thoughts 
I didn't realize that until I started recently getting really into stoicism and all the mm -hmm. Marcus Aurelius stuff, which has been helping me a lot. Mm -hmm. And then I realized, oh, my meditative art time sometimes spawns. And if I'm having like a, a friction point with somebody in my life, when I'm alone with myself and I'm dealing with the program fighting me, I end up adding them into that frustration. I'm like, oh shit. So I'm trying to unravel that, catch myself in those things and create a yeah. more positive cycle of thoughts. Do you ever have that happen? Kind of a well, personal I, thing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, I think it touch, touches back on what you were trying to ask, which is, I think there's these moments where, uh, and it's interesting, like I've seen it in pockets where I need to spend like a couple of years just making work by myself. And then there's these moments where sometimes um, I I wonder if I'm good at listening. Mm. And so there's been a couple of times where I've joined studios um, and I, this has happened a couple, couple times where it's like, yeah, you know, I've already been like super successful. Um, and then I've decided to go to work for a studio with like 200 people mm. and like, well, why do that? And it's like to get away from self, mm. like sometimes, yeah. you know, it's, sometimes I think like, oh, I can get too much into my head and like I'm tapping into this shit. And then all of a sudden, like I realize like I'm re really unpleasant. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> and then I get like, oh, OK, cool. I'm going to go join a studio and, uh, you know, I've got some sort of role and I just have to like shut the fuck up and just um, be the listener and have empathy. Mm. And so sometimes it's like some, uh, sometimes I feel like empathy drifts and, um, I can get into my head too much. Mm. I love that. Thanks for sharing that. That's a definitely like be the listener. I think that's a, a beautiful, the empathy. I, I've, I've started using this app called notion. I run my whole life through it now. It's been mm. helping me because a lot of times as you probably are well aware is a lot of things are disparate and abstract and you're like, where the fuck did that emotion come from? And why am I being like steamrolled with anger or like depression or elation? Yeah. Um, and then I realize, oh, it's because like, hey, I'm not sleeping well, I'm not eating well and all these things. And then it snowballs as we all are very aware of. But this yeah. helps me track it so I can be like, no, like this is why. And you're not being cautious of yourself. And then yeah. empathy, every, so every week I do like kind of a spiritual check-in it sounds so woo woo. I mean, I'm not a woo woo guy, but I have to be in order to achieve like spiritual enlightenment. And one of the things is just, I have this, 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 uh, principles, my life principles, which I've written and constructed. And it's one of them is gratitude. And it's just like, you know, taking a moment to be like, just sit there and just be grateful. Cause that's the currency. That's truly the currency of the universe. Well, however you want to say it. It's like, if you can baseline yeah. at the value of gra gratitude, you can go, man, there's so many things to be thankful for and a ton of like, and I think you can mostly find something and that really can, I feel like if I'm floating spiritually or if I'm out of reach, out of orbit, I, that gratitude brings me back and says, no, this is, you're human. This is good. You're okay. You're trying your best and just be thankful for this one small thing and then itemize that, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I, I think that helps with moving the goalposts. That's a good it's point. Like, yeah. It's like a lot of times if I have a, a, a goalpost in front of me and I get up to that goalpost and if I take the time to pause mm -hmm. and then assess and it's like, it's a fucking miracle I've gotten here. <laughs> you know, it's like yeah. I, I've shown at Christie's now five times. That's wild, dude. <laughs> and if you just like back up and go, that's an institution that typically deals with dead people. <laughs> like, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like the their business comes there. Yeah. is selling dead artists and mm -hmm. you're still alive, motherfucker. Yeah. Like, yeah. and if it's like, again, and it's like, oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. If I can be thankful for that progression, mm -hmm. then all of a sudden it just helps me move the goalpost because you can sort of take stock mm -hmm. of. Like, yeah, you don't need to win this game. You're mm -hmm. progressing so far down the field. And if you just take a moment to like look back mm -hmm. it, and just be aware of how far things have gotten. Yeah. Um, not only does it help, I think, squash a lot of the, the imposter syndrome, yeah. the fear, the anxiety, and it helps move the goalpost a little bit. It's, just, it's wonderfully uh, to embrace that humility for sure. Yeah. How do you even quantify that, Josh? How do you even think of, do you think about that? I mean, you must, you must think about that. Like you just said, to be alive, 
to be an artist to be alive and to be an artist and to be in this ecosystem of value, I mean, do you feel you deserve it? Do you belong there? Or do you, what, what's the feeling? Is this something that you carry with you as pride when you meet somebody and you explain this to them? Or how do you live with that? Because that's a really interesting thing. Uh, I think it, oh, that's a, it's really hard to quantify that. I think yeah. it's, a, it's an addiction. Mm. Yeah, and I think it's, it's maybe. Yeah. I think it's like an addiction, or even I would say a, a, a disability. Um, <laughs> Elaborate, it's almost, please. It, it, Love that. I love but it's all it, addiction right? and disability. Yeah, yeah, it's almost like. But think about it. It's like it's it's almost like a disability where I have this compulsion, where I have to wake up every morning and I have to express myself through form and color, and if mm. I don't. I go fucking insane and I'm a really <laughs> intolerable person. And so it's like, if I can just like work out the pink, the yellow, the purple and the triangles and arrange them in a way that makes my brain go, this is good. You don't have to kill anybody now. <laughs> then I can like, right. Yeah. It's, it's almost like it's an addiction and a disability. Yeah, and I've got yeah. this way where it's like we've talked about you know, this. Remember, I told you when you're the drug and the drug dealer, <laughs> that shit gets really interesting. Yeah, <laughs> but sorry, right? you got in the way. What, what were you saying? I just think it's. Uh, I think you know people are like, oh, let me tell you how I'm feeling. You know, mm. and it's like, uh, the, uh, um, let me I'll, I'll, let me show you uh, some orange to purple gradients with triangles and then like see like this is how i'm feeling like does this calm you like this calms me so i think <laughs> there's like this yeah it's this weird and now i don't know if this story is true i'm going to tell you a story and I, I don't know if this story is true but i have a friend dave who was photographing takashi murakami and he goes to japan and he uh, finally gets around to like meeting takashi and and it and I'm paraphrasing the story, but it was something where like my buddy David says like, okay, we're going to take some pictures at the, um, at the studio. And then like, I would love to see like your apartment, like your place, like photograph you in your home, right. To help paint the story, tell the story. And I, the way the story goes is that Takashi's like, um, there is no home. And Dave says, well, what do you mean? And he says, well, sometimes I just like sleep here on the floor or like, like I sleep in hotels. Mm -hmm. And, and my buddy Dave was like, so you don't have like a home base, like you don't have an apartment. And the story's like, <laughs> no, no, I, you know, I just like either like sleep here on the, and then like my buddy Dave says like some comment, like, well, like, how does your girlfriend feel about that? Or how does your wife feel about that or whatever? And the story is like, Takashi goes like, I have none. Well, there, I, there is no girlfriend. Like. <laughs> There's no, and it all like boiled down to this idea. And this is again, Dave telling me the story. It's like, I only have like a few years on this planet and there's this, I've got more ideas and more things that I need to try to get out mm. before I exit this existence. Mm. And there's something about that. And it's funny because that's also in the fountainhead. There's this like really beautiful quote. It's like, you know, like, like I'm 22 years old and, you know, I, I'm probably going to live until like 60 and, you know, I want to make sure that I'm spending like the 30 years of my career doing something that I enjoy. Other words, I'm just prescribing myself to 30 years of torture. Yes. Yeah. Uh, it's kind of, it's kind of the quote, how it get goes. Get busy living or get busy <clears throat> dying. Shawshank so part, so part of me is like, <laughs> you know, I've got, I've got, so many ideas in my head of things that I like want to see happen or I want to see explored, but I'm not sure if I'm going to be on this planet long enough to get them all out. Yeah. So no it's way. an addiction and it's a disability mm. where um, I have to, I have to wake up and I have to, you know, I have to do this stuff in order to, to achieve some sort of sanity. Mm. Yeah. Because uh, I'm really like, uh, and I hate to say this, I hate to say this, but like, if you could describe like my worst nightmare, it would be like going to the Caribbean and sitting on a beach. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> so and funny. which is weird because like i think that's most people like they go on vacation like they go to the caribbean they sure. sit on the beach well, they're and they do for nothing them, right? yeah. and they do nothing yeah. and to me that's like i fucking hate the beach <laughs> and the idea of like sitting there doing nothing <laughs> is is uh like i start to go insane yeah. I, I literally start to lose my mind mm. because the idea of like relaxing by doing nothing mm is uh it just it does not compute does so joshua doesn't meditate <laughs> joshua does not meditate yeah no 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 yeah no there's meditation it's just this idea of nothingness yeah of doing nothing that drives me crazy mm -hmm. which is probably why i don't watch tv mm -hmm. like i don't think i've never seen friends your I've sense never of purpose is attached to active to activate yeah. it's too i've gotta I've, I've got to uh i don't like this these passive things where you just are like a an empty participant. Mm. I just, I can't like, it's like the, my worst nightmare. That's interesting. <laughs> it's like mm. sitting on a beach, just like uh, five minutes in, I'm like, fuck. Okay. Uh, <laughs> help. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's cool. I mean, the good thing is, you know that about yourself. And then mm. yeah. it reminds me on my honeymoon with my wife, we went to St. Lucia and I was basically you under prison and I felt so bad for her because I was like, this fucking sucks. I hate this. It's an impoverished place, which I can't enjoy myself because I can't be like, yeah, I'm sipping my ties. And then like, there's people that are living in a shack and I could tell it displeases them. So I can't enjoy that because I'm codependent. And then I also was like, what the fuck do I do with my time? So I brought a bunch of books. I read them and I was like, I, I just felt bad for her because my wife can my wife can completely unplug and just chill and she could do nothing. And that's just like that's her superpower. And I'm like, mm. I'm the same. But I've over the years, maybe because my wife has showed me and also being so close to her that I've learned more at the calmness of doing moments of nothing, which has helped me kind of go, you know, I will never achieve completion of this. I'll never. And once I can live with that and go, that's okay. You'll never reach that. So it's okay to be quiet in the nothingness. But I'm also such a fucking busy body. It's really, <laughs> my wife knows it too. Right when we come back, we just went to Kauai and it's like, we just have different ways we vacation. And I grew up in Hawaii, so I have a connection to the Aina, the land and stuff. But, and yeah. when I was there and there was moments where I could lay on the beach for a little bit, but I'm like, okay, I'm going to go jog. I got to go run the beach and like, I'll be back. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to go swim in the ocean for like an hour and get pummeled. And then I'm coming back while she can yeah. just chill. You know, it's just... well, it's funny. We had, we had to push this talk because I was actually in the middle East. Hmm. Um, what brought you there? I flew, uh, doing an installation. Hmm. And uh, so I flew to Qatar and then I flew first time? to first time in the middle East. Hmm. Yeah. I've done a couple of projects in the middle East. But I never got a chance to go. Like I would build something and then send it over. Honest take? Uh, What's your honest take? Yeah. Because you just came back. That's tough. Yeah. So I I first went to Qatar and then I went to Riyadh, Saudi Arabia. And like the problem is, is like when you go to those places, you're being so bombarded with color, form, texture, mm -hmm. sights, smells that like I'm just firing on all. Like I could not get back fast enough. Because now I'm like, okay, I got to get all these ideas down. Mm. And so I think like, that's my problem with like trying to relax while traveling is it's impossible. Yeah. It's impossible. Because you're sort of, you're dropped in this culture mm. where um, it's so new and it's so fresh that you're really seeing the, the visible and visible, yeah. which yeah. is, you know, it's like you get dropped in a thing that's so common to everybody else but it's so new to you that you're like, Oh my God, like, you know, look at this, uh, look at this pattern. And they're like, Oh yeah. Like, well, I don't even really see that pattern anymore because that pattern is everywhere. Mm. And so because it's everywhere and you're sort of bombarded with it your entire life, it becomes this visible invisible thing. Yeah. Yeah. And mm. so like when I get dropped into places, your brain I'm does it like, so it doesn't get overwhelmed. Oh, it can process. Yeah, the, yeah. I'm completely like, just, you know, Cause imagine psychotic. living like that every day. Your brain eventually yeah. goes, okay, I can't do this. We're going to zone that all out. Zone that all out. Yeah. So it becomes this like invisible beauty that's like hiding in plain sight. Yeah. yeah. And so, you know, I think the Middle East was was really fascinating for me because it is, 
it is it is such a a, a culmination of senses mm. like everything smelled a certain way mm. and the air was dry and you realize you're in the desert and everything is sort of tan and brown and and with pockets of green and you're just constantly uh, uh absorbing these different uh senses that uh it's just hard to be inspired now h- how do i feel of things about politically like i can't i don't even want to talk about that like yeah. i can't even i don't even I have enough information to even i don't have enough information to, 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 to have debate valid, this thing yeah, to have a ballot or to thing. like yeah i mean why even bother with that so it's like i can go into a place and i can meet people and i can meet the people who live there and those people are human and they're lovely like every other place mm-hmm. yeah <laughs> and, that's the general summation most of the time right yeah how do I feel about their government? Well, I I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I have my own problems with our own. Is it good? Is it bad? Is it yeah. sure? <laughs> so it's like you know when I travel to places, it's it's this constant bombardment of seeing all these visible stimuli mm-hmm. that then starts to like build up with like fuck. I'm never. I'm gonna die before I can get all of these oh, yeah. things out of my head. You can you <laughs> could you could be a world traveler. That could be your job, and you wouldn't even see the world. It's not yeah. possible. Yeah. You could be a music lover and love music indefinitely and even just a certain type of music and you'll never listen to every song that was ever made in the thing that yeah. you love. But here's a fascinating thing that, <laughs> that I would love to talk about. I've been working on a piece of software called The Void and um, The Void I've been working on for, gosh, almost 10 or 11 years. Um, and it's a long form piece of code and, and it, it's set up in such a way where um, right now, today, it can produce over 36,000 different compositions mm. and animations, all unique looks, mm. 36,000 different unique looks. And I've maybe explored 50 of them. Oh, wow. <laughs> and so there's this idea that I find really fascinating now. I think now that because I'm getting older and I'm, I'm having medical problems, you know, like I recently was hospitalized because I had my uh, gallbladder removed. You know, it's like old man shit. <laughs> and uh, thinking about like, you know, can I work on a piece of software that I continually contribute to and expand as like a living organism that could potentially continue to make work well after I'm dead? Mm. And so hmm. it's fascinating well, to like, this, it's fascinating to like visit these places and be like, okay, cool. Now I've got like Saudi Arabia stuck in my head. Mm. Like, how can I, how can I mark this software with this imprint of like form and texture that is a moment in my life that will potentially continue to be this thing that can produce artwork well after I'm dead. Hmm. And so it's really like this diary. It's like this diary of writing code, of writing this like long form piece of software that like okay, here's when I was in Japan. Here's when I was in Istanbul. Here's when I was in Saudi Arabia. Here's when I was in Bangkok. And it becomes this like visual uh, uh, thing that can continue uh, to make work after I've left, left this planet, hmm. you know? And, and it's, if you think about musicians, this is very common. Like, you know, there's now this thing with uh, John Lennon, right? Like they just, um Peter Jackson is working on this piece of software that was able to use AI to separate um, all the content from these tapes that were recorded by John Lennon. And, Mm. you know, they just came out with a new song, you know, that is John Lennon. Hmm. (laughs) Like, Mm. you know, that's obviously debatable. Yeah. But, uh, you know, I I like this idea that, you know, I'm working on this, this long form piece of software that is like a diary of experiences that I've had that could be potential um, pieces of artwork after I'm dead. Mm. And now that the blockchain has happened and now that we have NFTs, you Mm. know, my daughter could be the custodian of this wallet and this work. I mean, it's, 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 it's interesting now that I have this white beard (laughs) that (laughs) I'm thinking about my mortality more. You know, has that come um, up a lot in your thoughts, your mortality? Do you think about death often? Yeah, sure. Every day. Yeah, I think. I mean, that's why I got a skull tattooed on my neck. Mm. It's this idea of memento mori, like mm. 
it's it's beautiful to sort of wake up in the morning and like look at the skull saying you know w- soon this will be you mm. uh so th- the clock is ticking mm. and i think if i look at the skull and i look and i think about mortality you know it start then i start to think about like how much how much time do i have to get out this story that i'm trying to tell mm. and will it will it ever be finished the answer is no <laughs> uh, like, you know, like the the book will never end. You yeah. know, I had a. You, I, I will end at some point, but but uh, yeah. I I think it's I I think it's healthy. I think it's healthy it to is. think about. There's a about book called death. The Denial of Death. Have you read that book? I haven't. It sounds like I should. It's fascinating because it's yeah. it says basically most of our psyche and our way of operating is based on death, and our denial of mm. it creates this really interesting friction within us that creates yeah. like a lot of wasted energy basically but because I, I just hit 40 and i'm coming up and i'm like wow what's weird and my, my wife was like what's up with um, you guys having these midlife crises and i and i said well i think i don't know what it is for everybody else but i think growing up as a i mean i only know my own existence but growing up as a guy i was just kind of i was like oh i'm immortal i could do whatever i want this is how I operate. I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to continually kill everything and just be a beast, you know? And then you're like, Oh shit, my back. And then I got to remove my gallbladder, you know? And you're yeah. like, Oh shit. Like you start to realize. And I think that a lot of people, I know some that are like when that wall comes up and that reflection hits them with full truth. And they're just like, shit, <laughs> I need to shift some things because I've been on cruise control I haven't, thankfully. I've taken the harder route, not being on cruise control. So I'm constantly checking with myself. But I have, there's moments in my life recently I'm like, like almost brought to tears thinking like, fuck, this is going to be over. And I don't want it to be over. I'm really right. starting to come into who I need to be finally overcoming so many things. This past two years have been massive spiritual shifts for me, like great, really mm. big ones, like big progressive ones. And the denial of death, I have not finished the whole book, but it's been because I usually read about five books at the same time and I get interested in one. And one of them is like Harry Potter, you know, so like one's <laughs> like a silly, guilty pleasure, nicely written little novel. And then I go into like the gnarly psychological ones. Another thing I was going to add to what you mentioned about being a night owl, I'm reading a book called Why We Sleep. And the author was saying that when we were evolving from the Neanderthal age, it was common for one part of the species to be a daytime creature to watch the tribe during the daytime and then the nighttime tribe. And it's genetically coded. So not everybody is predispositioned to be a morning person or a night person. This is why there's this like, because the nine to five in the industrial age had occurred, you're like, oh, you're lazy or I would always be criticized for being a night owl because like, oh, you're not doing anything because they don't know. It's unquantifiable. They don't know while they're sleeping that we're sitting there building the music box, you know, which is interesting. It was kind of good fuel for me. And I was like, fuck, where is this data before I could have just put in my dad's face? Like, look, see, (laughs) I'm genetically (laughs) mutated to be working at night. Yeah. But I also, I love the mornings. I, I love, I love watching the sun rise and then, being in a circadian rhythm with nature is just like so fucking awesome sleeping when it's that's what like when I was in Kauai they have this is why I love Hawaii they're sovereign to the land and it's very dark in Kauai have you been to Kauai no never been never been to Hawaii oh okay well if you ever get a chance it's beautiful and if you like nature Kauai is the island they have this endangered um, bird and they were putting they had in the past they would put up these lights and then they were finding the dead birds at the base of these lights and then they were realizing that the bird was flying into them and dying, but it became an endangered, uh, endangered species. So they took all the lights off the, the island so you, there, and it's really dark. So mm-hmm. also with that is everything kind of just closes. People live circadian, like they live, the sun's up, we're up, sun's down, mm-hmm. that's it. And it's kind of interesting, you know, it's completely opposite to the, like us, you, you're in a radio shack basically. And yeah, and my office is somewhat dark. I like to keep it dark, but yeah, <laughs> it's just, it's just an interesting, different thing. I love that you travel. We talk a lot of, you know, we, we've, we've encountered one another in various locations on the planet 
And that's been really fun. Travel is an important part of who you are, right? Yeah, I, I don't think, I think I would have an inability to make work if two things didn't exist. One is music. Mm, yeah, music. Yeah. Um, and two is traveling. Mm. And again, it it's because it's that idea of like being dropped in a, uh, a country, a culture that um, can inspire you in a way that you, you've never thought of before. And again, it's that seeing the, the, the visible invisible. Mm. Um, and so, yeah, I take a lot of, um inspiration from from being dropped into place you know and even even to the point where i'm marking my body you know so every country i go to i try to get you know tattooed in that country i love that as like as sort of like a memory you know like my latest ones are I in bangkok the, i got I the, the eye. buddha eyes yeah, yeah yeah so is that by that you know, particular like, artist that does those awesome eyes oh i, I don't know okay i'll have to send you their these... work i follow them i can't yeah. remember their name but they do these really awesome eyes they'll like tattoo a dude's head with like these awesome yeah. eyes is that the guy well I, oh i have no idea yeah. i don't i don't know if I'll it's find the it guy and send it. yeah but i love i love you know it's yeah. like and also it's like why get this well it's buddha's eyes <laughs> and they're they're half open and half closed mm. so it's this idea of navigating the conscious and unconscious world mm. you know that's cool seeing seeing you know the the conscious real world mm. and also tapping into the the unconscious subconscious dream world mm. so it's like right yeah. and like you i wouldn't know about that idea or that story without traveling that was explained then, like, to you mark... there the the i yeah oh, yeah cool. yeah and then like I marking that was it you on my... like applying your own meaning. no oh, okay no 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 you go to a thing. place and it's like oh okay cool like like i want that on my body so it's a reminder to like navigate the the, the conscious and the subconscious That's right cool um, you know, when I got sober, I got, you know, this in Chinese, which translates to like addiction is a parasite. Mm. So it's this idea where it's mm. like, I can look at my body and go, yeah, I should probably not drink and do drugs. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so it's like this constant, uh, marking of the body. Of, Reminders of like, bookmarks. yeah, like, and, and again, like a diary, like just, you know, I can look at all the things on my body and say like, okay, you know, if you count the lines it equals 42, which is the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, you know, the meaning of life, the universe, and everything. Mm. Like all these like weird... Um, yeah, personal things. Weird w weird personal things that I sort of want to mark on my body as like a reminder of like, of, uh, of, of identity. Mm. And it's weird, like I look back at old pictures of myself before I had tattoos and I like, I don't know who that person is. Yeah. Like I look at the photo and I go like, who, like, I don't, I don't know this, this person. And <laughs> when did you first start weird. getting tattoos? So the first tattoo I got was a year before I got sober. Mm. And it was this one that just says, you know, obviously it's the one that's faded the most. Yeah. yeah. And it's uh everything in one night. Mm. Right. And it was like that live fast, die young, like do it all attitude. Mm. Uh, and that was like the only tattoo that I got while I was still still using. And then once I got sober, what was your um, drugs that you were using? Oh, I had a great cocktail, Ash. Yeah, all <laughs> of the drugs. Is that the answer? Well, so I got sober. Uh, I got sober January seventh, nineteen ninety five. Wow, and you've been sober since then. Yeah, I have wow. not had any drugs or alcohol since that date. Wow, um, that's a huge accomplishment. Massive. Addiction is it's gnarly. It's pretty crazy. Yeah. And at the time, the reason why I got sober was there was a bad spell of heroin uh, that went through um, New York City and it killed 11 people. Mm. And one of those 11 people was a guy who overdosed and died in my bathroom. Oh, yeah. So, Wake up call. Yeah. 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 So I had this kind of like perfect cocktail um, where um, I would start drinking and then I would... Um, uh, this is like the New York club scene mm. in like, you know, the, the early nineties. It's like a banging so you, scene back then too, huh? Like well, the, here's what's even crazier. Um, there was a guy named Ma Michael Alec and, um, there was a movie about him called party monster where, um, <laughs> he kills a guy, uh, named angel. Uh, and angel was my very good friend and, 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 um, he killed him with a hammer. Wow. Um, and he was my boss, Michael Alec. Um, I worked for him at, um, the limelight 
uh, Club USA and the tunnel. And so if you go onto Wikipedia, uh, you'll read about Michael Alleg and it'll say his club kids. And my name is listed. Oh, yeah. I was like one of his club kids. And uh, I used to make these like elaborate costumes and and uh, used to go out and party like I w- channeled my art mm. into making these um, uh, these sort of elaborate um, demons. And I would go to nightclubs and I would get like free drugs and uh, all the attention in the world. And my cocktail was like I would start off with like ecstasy. And then I, as soon as I would peak on ecstasy. I would take special K so that I would go into like a K hole and, and basically I'd be paralyzed. It's a horse tranquilizer. Jeez. It's ketamine, wow. ketamine, mm. like massive doses of ketamine. And then at the end of the night, like heroin to be able to, to, to go to sleep. And, um, it was like this constant, like, uh, uh overdosing and just taking things way too far. Mm. And then when, the wake up call was, is like when this guy died in my bathroom, Ash, I can say with pure honesty that my feeling at that time was how upset I was because this guy fucked up my high. Mm. And he was dead. Mm. Mm. He was dead in my bathtub. Mm. And, and it was like a culmination of that whole thing where yeah. like, I thought I was the world's greatest artist, but I wasn't making any work. Yeah. Like all I did was was like party and do drugs Mm. and so uh so i ended up getting sober january 7th 1995 um i ended up going to aa and na and like learning about like that program and and it 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 worked for me yeah um and i don't know if it works for everybody but it it worked for me the strong program i was yeah i was really able to sort of like restart my life and Mm. really become the artist that i i thought i could be Mm. Um, and that was only through, through being sober. And there's this, like, there's this real clarity that occurs, like after you've sort of unpolluted yourself with alcohol and drugs, that, um, there's like this awareness that is remarkable, um, that has really worked for me. Hmm. And so, yeah, I have, uh, I've not had drugs or alcohol since January 7th, 1995. And, and every year I celebrate that date, like a, like a birthday. Mm, As you (laughs) should, it's a a new chance on life. Yeah. It's a huge accomplishment. It's also, I would say from a perspective, it's, it's, it's quite wonderful that you were able to experience that without dying, but then also to be able to look at it and be like, that was another version of myself too, which is also, it's kind of a interesting blessing yeah. well it's done some really interesting things because it's like i know how to tap into that part of mm. consciousness now yeah it's like doing acid and doing mushrooms and doing ketamine and and doing all those things yeah. like i know how to get into a state of of uh meditation and an awareness to tap into that ability mm. of being able to experience and consume something outside of the norm Mm. and if i had not been that person and not done those things i don't know if i would have the tools to look at a reflection of light a certain way and be dazzled by it (laughs) you know what i mean like there are moments where i'd be like holy fuck does everybody see this and everybody's like motherfucker it's just light like (laughs) you're like yeah 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 but 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 (laughs) you know and it's like i don't you know so i'm thankful that there that was a chapter in my life yeah I should be dead, no question. Mm. Um, but being able to like have been that person has informed the ability to tap into that consciousness mm-hmm. without needing uh, those chemical compounds to to get to those destinations. Mm. Yeah, that's cool. Like I can have some really wonderful flashbacks. Mm. I can have these really wonderful like dream state. Uh, moments where i'm like oh yeah this this euphoria that i feel is because i've tapped into this breathing this calmness Mm. this light with this like you know yeah i've heard that you can activate a lot of these things potentially naturally mm. through breathing and meditation million percent techniques and stuff which is that's why i said i think it's really quite great that you're able to experience that rawness of life Growing up, I was straight edge and I had a lot of friction problems with people that did drugs. And 
Sure. Not until later do I realize it's not the person, it's just the activity. And then the, I mean, it's not the activity, it's the person and potentially. And then I remember Maynard uh, from Tool, he had said, I think I'm paraphrasing what he said. He said, do the drug, then try to synthesize it within yourself. So use it as a base to kind of see, oh, wow. Okay, this is what mm. you do. Then try to synthesize it within yourself naturally. That's really the true peak, which is really interesting, you know, um, mm. which is... I think, you know, drugs are obviously pretty deeply connected to art. And I think that's because they unlock a lot of expression and I think they unlock a lot of who we ways of seeing ways of seeing. That's exactly, that's a good way of saying it. And, uh, it's interesting. It's been really, it's, it's, it's a, it's a really interesting part of being a human. I think, you know, um, Mm. it's a, fascinating one it's a very humbling one too as well and it also like i feel like it just turns up and ramps up all of who you are and just Mm -hmm. and it kind of goes okay well you're this person but you're really this person and and also um it can show you who you don't want to be which is also kind of a beautiful thing too it just ramps it up i i think there was a part of me that liked being the certain way Mm. and being able to like see things and experience things a certain way And I didn't realize that I could be that person without the conduit. Mm, yeah. And so all of a sudden I realized like, oh, no, no, no. You can be a fucking weird motherfucker without like, yeah. you could just go there. Yeah. You could just be that person. Yeah. Um, and it and so it took me a while to realize that like, I didn't need those things in order to be this thing that I enjoyed. Mm. Um, and, and, and again, that just, it took a lot of work mm. to, to be able to, to, to get there. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, it's like, I'm, I'm grateful for that chapter, but also, you know, I think the other thing too, is like now, you know, it's like, what it's harder to try to maintain that sobriety Mm. because as things get farther away, I sort of fear like, was it really that bad? Uh, yeah, <laughs> you know, like, true. You look at the, it with the There's the forgetfulness. Memory. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, right. Yeah. Like and I was so saying about like Henry be- Ford and all, I think history is 20. I mean, looking yeah. back is very scary if you don't have a true perspective on things. And then they invent shit that I've never tried, like DMT. Like, of course I want to talk to math space aliens. <laughs> Fuck! Like, if you like, were to do DMT, do you think it would? Do you think that would <laughs> unlock you and and unravel you? Is your identity now wrapped in the identity that I am now sober, Josh, forever and eternity because I'm a part of this life? Or, yeah, I think, I think there's this, I, I think there's this acute awareness that everything that I have become mm. is because of this action, mm. and I, mm. and so I have, uh nothing to lose and everything to gain. Mm, mm, mm. And so if I were to fall off the wagon, um, I can't, I, 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 I would be right back to where I was mm, and okay. I'd, I'd probably kill, I'd probably kill myself. Yeah. So, so best not to, um, yeah. it's probably best not to. Yeah. Right. So especially with your personality, like, knowing who you are. Yeah. Especially with my personality. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, if there's ever a person t- is, if there's ever a person in your life to know the best, it should be yourself. Yeah. And you should know and love yourself truly. And you should understand mm. that, that, you know, you're a flawed creature. <laughs> and as simple as that, as much as you would want to deny that you're a flawed creature. I'm living, and I'm living with a disability and an addiction. Yeah. I like that. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's, that's actually a really multifaceted. <laughs> That's just the wildness of life, though, and being able to see it. I think that's probably when you have these conversations. I mean, you don't have these kind of conversations normally with normal people. I don't know how to define that. And I don't mean to be uh, speak down about it, but this is definitely an artist conversation where it's just like open and tangential and also abstract, but true understanding, <laughs> which is good. Mm. Well, I appreciate you sharing that because it's, um, yeah, sobriety is definitely something that is not easy it's a difficult task um it's a day-to-day thing i imagine it's a working process all the time but it's really cool that you can synthesize it and use art as a vessel because i truly find for me personally i think it's the same for you is i'm addicted to art it's an addiction i my identity my ego is all wrapped into like these this masturbatory act that i do selfishly by myself (laughs) And obviously, sometimes I don't. I'm, I'm sure you probably share this as well. Is sometimes the art is even better when you 
blend with the right collaborator and you're like, oh shit, I didn't know we can go to these heights. Wow, this is really fucking cool. Yeah. And that, that goes back to always being the student too. Yeah. Always. I think if yeah. you take, if you take Easy time to, to collaborate, you're, you're, you're interfacing with somebody who's going to be thinking differently. Yeah. who's going to be making marks differently. And do you like to collaborate? That's get you out of your, I, I like to collaborate you like with cl- people. You don't like, no, you no, don't no, like I, the Middle East and you don't like, <laughs> there's, a, there's a little asterisk there. Like I love to collaborate, but it, I typically has to be somebody who's outside of what I do. Mm-hmm. You know, so usually my collaborators are musicians because I think they're, you know, there's this ability to say like, okay, well, you're doing this thing and I'm doing this thing and it's going to come together to, uh, to create this kind of new thing. Yeah. You know, I'd like, if I was collaborating with another generative artist, I was like, too much. Know, okay, it's, great. Uh, my buddy yeah, it's Anthony too, says too. like, when you have a hat on, you don't put another hat on. It's called the hat on, yeah. he called the hat on the hat, you know? <laughs> Yeah, there you well, go. Your collaborators should always compliment your weaknesses with their strengths. And, all, and definitely that's where you learn the most and that's where you get hybridized. And then it's like, we see it continual in nature. Nature thrives with variety. You know, you combine these species and these genes and then they create these varieties and then things, you know, perpetuate basically. Um, music. Music is a, yeah. music's important to you. It's very important to you. I know it is. What is it? What does music mean to you and where does it fit in your life? I, I just don't know if my work would ever exist without music. Mm. Um, Same. If if music didn't exist, I don't think there would be a Joshua Davis. Mm. Um, because it, I I get into this landscape creation, which is you know you put something on, and it you're in a void, and then all of a sudden like the landscape starts to present itself, mm. and it's you know what, what so what is that? Or is it is it dark? Is it foggy? Is it through, you know, uh, the, the dark woods? Is it scary, you know, mm. or is it transcendental? Are you elevated? Are you, uh, surfacing some, some place, mm. right? And so I can put on music and I can start to contextualize and texturize and formulate the, the, the thing that I'm seeing. And then it's like, okay, I got to get that down. Mm. And so it's like, I've got to listen to this music and I've got to make this work that I feel like is a companion to this thing that, that um, I'm hearing sonically. And so, you know, in the early eighties, this was like goth and it, it was like tail end of punk and kind of getting into more industrial and goth music, like listening to, Sisters of Mercy, Christian Death, Skinny Puppy, Ministry, um, right? And sort of like, uh, then from that transcending into like more metal and more hardcore, Hmm. and then like eventually getting into like EDM Hmm. and things that are uh, more atmospheric, right? And it's like, walking this this path sonically you know throughout you know my lifetime um there's it's always been a a movie it's always been a picture and i can i i'm it this just been the soundtrack Mm. and so you know i can uh i've done work for tool you know you mentioned uh maynard and i worked with them when they were working on their Ten Thousand days album amazing and um I was working with like Adam Jones and, mm. and I think the rumor was like, they found my work because they like, they would trip acid and look at my like uh, stuff that I was making. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Bless them. Right. <laughs> so like when I was listening to tool and like 10,000 days album, right. Like it, it's, it's, it's a place. Oh, it's yeah. It's a, <laughs> it's a place. Yeah. And it's, you're, a, it's a place in the tele- psyche of humanity. Yeah. You're teleported to that place and it, it has form. Yeah. And, you know, I, I typically, uh, I want to, I want to synthesize that reality into, to something that I can visually, uh, digest with my eye. So I don't think if there, if there was no music, there's, there's no me. Mm. It's just, it's really that simple. I feel very connected to that. Still that way. Yeah. Yeah. Music is... (sighs) It's the thing that I'm constantly inundated myself with on purpose. <laughs> mm. And I'm always on search. I found this new thing that's been really interesting where I let 
iTunes, like the iTunes radio. And I just let it find things that it thinks I might like. And I'm like, fuck, I've never heard like 80% of this because I found myself perpetuating the same cycle of music that I like. I'm like, Oh, like I feel like listening to Rollins man today. And like, okay. And I just want that scratch that itch. But I realized that by letting chance happen and then the computer to say, here's some gifts. And I'm like, this is some of the best music I've ever heard. And I never even heard this band before. And it's been so, I just love it. And I love sharing music. Like friends of mine know that I'm constantly like, listen to this. I know you're going to love this because I think of music as a drug as well for me. You know, it's like, I remember Bjork said in one of her lyrics, she said like my headphones saved my life, which I know she means the music, but something like, she can't live without music. The The impact of life without music, it's really weird. Sometimes I'll go multiple days without listening to music. Say I'm on vacation for like a complete reprieve. And then when I come back to music, I'm just like, fuck, this is so fucking awesome. <laughs> like, Especially that perfect peak when the music hits you just right. And you're in that 4 a.m. cycle and you're just like hit the Nirvana peak and the song hits you and you're just like, what the fuck? <laughs> Music's amazing. I'm so thankful. That's that's another gratitude thing. I'll probably write maybe tomorrow or tonight expressing my admiration for my ears for giving me such a pleasurable joy through my years and music. Yeah. <laughs> Did you ever make music or play music? I'm definitely a closet drummer. Okay, closet drummer. And I and I uh yeah, I love why drums? I love. I don't know. There's just like a, a, a there's because it's pattern. Mm, yeah, I can see that. You know, there's a pattern, it's a loud. repetition, and a pattern to it, <laughs> and there's a physicality to it yeah. that um, I just gravitate towards. I think my favorite drummer is probably Chris Penny from uh, um, The Refused. Mm, he's probably yeah. my favorite. He's probably my very favorite drummer uh, very uh, original. Kind of a small set, but original with the way that he had. It's definitely like I mean, if I mean, math I mean, were drumming. What's weird is you said <laughs> you said the band, and I instantly heard his drums, which that's pretty mm. unique, actually. You know. Yeah. Huh. I love that band. What a you un- that uh that album that they made. I can't remember. I'm bad with names, but it's their main one. But it has a violin. Uh, the future shape of punk to come. Yeah, future shape of punk to come. My brother introduced me to that, and I was yeah. like, "What the fuck Great is album. this?" My brother introduced me Great to album. a lot of music at an early age. And same with my mom. Hey, too. and if you, if you want a if you want an album that is Joshua Davis's brain, yeah. then listen to Phantomos Suspended Animation. <laughs> so Phantomos uh is I, like I a super that? band. Phantomas, yeah. uh, F A N T O M A S, and the band, the album is called Suspended Animation, and Phantomas is um, Mike Patton oh, okay, as yeah. on vocals, <laughs> Buzz Melvin on guitar. Oh, interesting. The bassist is from Mr. Bungle. Oh, okay, yeah. And Dave Lombardo is the drummer. Whoa, interesting. Holy shit! Wow, that's a lot that's, of personality happening. It's a lot of stuff. Yeah. So my like ultimate dream at some point, hopefully I can do this before I exit this earth Mm. is I've always wanted to take that album suspended animation. And I've wanted to write a piece of software that visualizes each one of the tracks on that album. Mm. Have you reached out to to try to, no, I I don't need to reach out to them. I'm just saying I need to, you can get it. (laughs) I need to visualize that album. Mm. Well, have you wrote to them and said what you want to do and no, no, it doesn't matter. That doesn't matter. Okay. It doesn't matter. Oh, I just didn't know it if you needed matter. to isolate it and they would give you the stem. No. So, okay. I think there's a there's a fear there's a there's a fear that I just I haven't I'm not at the level yet hmm? to really realize everything that happens sonically in that album. <laughs> I don't think you probably ever will. If it's something that hits you at a certain level, you're just gonna Oh my god, it's pure pure chaos. Yeah. Pure chaos. Huh. So anyway. Yeah. Try that album and go. Oh, okay, this makes sense. Yeah, I'm probably it'll probably uh, go see, over my I head see, a lot. I'm so particular. I see why Josh likes this. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, already Patton's Patton's uh, the way he expels music is very unique and interesting. I can only handle certain amounts at certain times. I'm mm. very particular about music, though. I I can appreciate almost all of it, even the bad stuff mm. or quote unquote bad. Like I can't fuck with country music or pop music and 
in the auto tune mm-hmm. rap stuff it just blo- it's like like stop it please it hurts you know like mm-hmm. i hate this so much but i can appreciate that it exists for a certain amount of people um but it's not for me at all <laughs> i'm so yeah my wife knows it. it's i'm, I'm so pre- i'm so picky on so many things and music is one of those things if we're in a car i'm the dj oh, indefinitely God. i'm sorry and then and, and yeah. if not you have to have good enough taste that aligns with mine that i can I go, okay cool we can fuck around but almost always mm-hmm. i like i have to take the steering wheel for the for the music <laughs> yeah yeah that that album is you're either gonna love it or hate it. There's definitely like, oh, that was okay. That's never that's never come yeah, out of polarizing. anyone's mouth. Yeah. What? <laughs> it's either like, this is insane. Yeah. Turn this off immediately, or you're gonna be like, oh, this is how my brain works. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, oftentimes that, too, uh, I find that like certain nuts. albums hit me at certain ages, and I'm like, what the fuck is this? And then I eventually, mm. like when I first heard this is like a first heard Radiohead, I was like, his voice is so lame. You know, oh, this is, it's weird. Yeah. And then eventually right. I was like, oh, it's brilliant. Okay. Oh, no, this, this is, is awesome. a fine, this is a fine one. Yeah, yeah exactly. Sure. It takes time. Like even glass jaw, like I first heard glass jaw and I was here listening to Daryl's voice. I was like, why is he singing so weird? Then I eventually go like, oh, no one sings like him. He's actually the best. <laughs> and it just becomes a thing. I think that's just evolving and being humbled by the idea that you really truly know nothing, not even yourself and your own taste, which is kind of scary. <laughs> Where so the funny thing for the funny thing for me is is that in the 80s, um, I started collecting album and album covers purely because of the art, mm, yeah. So, my favorite uh record label was 4AD, and all those album covers were made by Vaughn Oliver, whom you know they say never meet your heroes. Uh, I ended up getting to, to meet him before he passed away. Um, I was. He uh, did like the Pixies uh, and stuff. Oh my yeah. God! He did the Pixies, Clan of Zymox, um, uh, Cocktoo Twins. Mm. Like he did all of those album covers, and I remember just like consuming album covers. I remember consuming music purely because I liked the al- Like I would buy shit, anything 4AD put out. Mm. I didn't even need to listen to it. I'd just be like, "Great album cover!" Like mm. <laughs> definitely Strong buying brand. it. Yeah. Before I ever, you know, whatever, and it just so happened that I, then I ended up really liking the music, especially Cocktoo Twins. And Cocktoo Twins was was such a a, a, a staple um, in my my early years. And I remember, like, I didn't know that this was a job, but I knew that like there was somebody who made these covers, and I didn't know if it was like one people or different people. But I this like early identity was like I don't know what this is, but I want to I want to do this for the rest of my life. Mm. Like this idea of like listening to music and then trying to visualize and encapsulate in just one visual aesthetic what you're about to embrace sonically. Like I, I didn't know what that was, but I wanted this person's job. Yeah. <laughs> and it ended up that it was this guy, Vaughn Oliver. And, what an interesting uh, job too. I ended up meeting him um through Eric Speakerman at one of his conferences. And we, we met a couple of times and every single time I, I met this guy, I was just like, you don't seem to understand <laughs> how much of an impact, how much I on. love you. <laughs> He's like, okay, you're making it weird. Yeah. You're making it weird. <laughs> Were you um, hugging him doing physical touch? He is a very large British man. Perfect for hugging. No, man. His, 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 his love language was not physical. Oh yeah. Touch. You got to give him those big back hugs. Yeah. I think jujitsu uh, pre- precursor me for just hugging people. And definitely. Sure. <laughs> but yeah, but it's like, I just remember like consuming his work and just thinking, I don't, I don't know what this is, but mm. uh, what I, this, you know, like if this was a job and I didn't even know it was a job. Sure. It's like, you know, this is what I want to do for the rest of my life is, is, um, connect your art to music, visualize, visualize music. Yeah. 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 And, uh, I remember seeing you at a talk, you had done like this, like live set basically. I was like, man, this is fucking far out. And you were just like jamming. Mm. And I was like, what a cool energy. I felt bad because I was like, everybody just sat there and I just don't think that's the way to, in my mind, I was like, we should all be dancing and like having fun. You know, and that was like, I was, I was taking photos of you. At least I, that was a thing I could do. So I took a bunch of photos of you doing it, but I felt like this needs to be a thing where people can like actively interact with that mm. energy that you're putting out rather than sitting down. And most people are just, 
I understand it. They're just insecure to kind of move their body to a rhythm and to look stupid. But that's what dancing is. It's to celebrate the irony of life and the comedic aspects that we're all just skin suits walking it was so around. Hard to, <laughs> it was so hard to communicate that project too. And, and the, the short story of it is um, I get this text uh, just randomly on my phone. And it says, uh, hi, my name is Kieran Gandhi. And I'm the, the drummer uh, for this band called MIA which of course I had heard uh, Paper Planes as their big song. And I was like, oh yeah, this is great. Mm. And uh, so Kieran uh, mailed me, it just sent me a text and said, uh, you know, hey, uh, you know, if you ever wanted to do a collaboration, you know, I would, I would love to try to figure out how I play the drums and you make the work that you make. And she had no idea how, how I made my work. And so uh, she sends me this text and I text her back. And I was like, uh, funny <laughs> uh, you know i've been invited to give this talk at off in barcelona and i've had this idea about playing a piece of software and i was explaining to her how i make the work that i do that i make software and it's it's all built on this idea of algorithms and randomness and chance and and i was like it would be really beautiful if i could write a piece of software that performed for 45 minutes so when i get up on stage i would have my code ready and i would hit compile and when i hit compile all of the instructions <clears throat> of that program that I would write would build 45 minutes of something. Mm. What? I ha would have no idea. I had set up all the instructions mm. of what could happen, but as soon as I would hit compile, that piece of software would say, I have built you know, 45 minutes of something. Mm. And so we connected her and she would play, she gave me a, like a track that um, I could sort of write the software to. and then. Uh, we would play that kind of like click track, the software would build, and then she would play the drums on the top of that um, of that performance. So you saw her playing the drums in real time, and I was actually playing the software in real time. So that, that software would compile. I didn't know what I was going to get, but I had all these interrupts. So I would have like a MIDI controller and I could change things like tempo, hue, okay, make a kaleidoscope, don't make a kaleidoscope switch out, you know, the textures or whatever. So I was playing a, a MIDI controller uh, like an instrument that would change the software that was also listening to Kieran play the drums. And so it's like, we have a, an hour talk. You, you were there, yeah. an hour talk. I get it for 15 minutes and tried to like describe this thing that we were about to do that could only exist for that 45 minutes. And as soon as I quit the software, that moment would be gone forever. Mm. Um, and so happens I performed that software only three times and each time it get compiles something completely different. And again, I have to sort of like make these, these decisions to perform the instrument of interrupting the, the, the software. Mm. And so it's probably like one of, in my mind, it's, it's like one of those things in my 30 years of work that I'm like, for me, whether people liked it or not. Mm. For me, it was like, this is a real milestone. Like it's this pinnacle project where I can like really sit back and say, this is fucking beautiful. Like it took me 20 years to get to this point, to be able to write the software, to do this thing that could only exist for that moment and the participants watching this moment. Um, and it's like, it's one of those like staple things. And I've had that happen a few times. I've had that happen a few times over the 30 years where I can really like take stock and like back away and go, Holy fuck. Like that, that was a thing, mm. you know, and it's happened, you know, like a, a, a few times, a few times where I've just been like, if I were to die tomorrow, please remember me for the, <laughs> for these, like these few things that really have just shell shocked me. And that piece of software was, was one of them. And, and, uh, you know, I hope that for that 45 minutes, um, you know, people experienced magic and delight like like I did, mm. knowing that I was going to close the software and go thank you, and and that was that was going to be it. And you know, the only memories that we would have of that moment is you know it, of it being recorded or people like you in the audience taking pictures, and and uh, that moment is is fleeting. And I and I and I I love that it was. Mm. Yeah, it's beautiful. It was really fun. It had such a great experience for me just seeing an observer. That was really fun. Like that's cool. I think it sounds like it's kind of a 
it's like an a, some a, um, a culmination of all the things that you love the randomness chaos mm. the one time experience being present in the moment yeah. the art exposing itself to being you present. and music yeah. attached to it and and it's funny because that's a sobriety thing yeah. like we've got this thing in sobriety where you say um if you have one moment in the past and one uh, if you have one foot in the past and one few foot in the future you're pissing on today <laughs> Nice. Uh, so it, yeah, it's this idea of like being present mm. and that thing only being present for that particular moment, mm. I think is something that's, that's, that's really beautiful. Yeah. You um, gotta do more of it. It could be a, and then, yeah. you know, we, we haven't really talked about NFTs that much, but yeah. it would be Let's interesting to it. talk about. Yeah. I mean, it, it's, what is NFT? I what was I, it? I, sorry. I don't want to interrupt, but I want to, sure. what does it mean to you personally? This is something that I think we need to yeah. explain personally to you joshua yeah. before nfts and to you post nfts what does it mean to you yeah not the financial aspect i think the financial aspect is like the least most interesting thing about navigating that space and let me tell you why i have been doing digital art for 30 years and my first work was saved on five inch floppy disks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I remember those. And the then, real floppy disks. Then they, yeah. <laughs> the floppy disks. Yeah, that's why they were called floppy disks. Yeah. <laughs> then my work moved to three and a quarter. I love those. Hard, you know, hard disks. Yeah. And then we got SciQuest drives and jazz drives. Mm -hmm. And then we got zip disks. Yeah. And then so for me in my mind, it's like the 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 cataloging and preserving of work. Mm -hmm has always been this like monumental struggle. Mm. And right now I spend $700 a year for Dropbox business. Yeah, same. And all 30 years of my work yeah. is on the oh, cloud. That's good. Is it? Mm. Because what happens when I stop paying my bills? What happens when I die and, and I stop, like literally 30 years just evaporates. Mm. And so now, again, thinking about mortality, I invest in a, a, a NAS, NAS drive. Yeah, I have that so too. It's, it's right here. So it's got like, synology? you know, a, it is. Yeah, I have a 192 <laughs> terabyte one with redundancy. Mine's about half that. Yeah, yeah mine's about uh, stupid, 90 uh, stupid video files, dude. Sheesh. Yeah, see, that's where you went. Wrong. <laughs> I did go wrong. <laughs> I need to do code. <laughs> Listen, man, in 2001, I burned my entire hard drive onto CD ROM. Oh, man. Because <laughs> <laughs> I was just writing software. Yeah. So, you know, in 2001, I did the PlayStation CD and I literally mm. took a year's worth of work and I burned it onto a, a CD-ROM drive. <laughs> um, but, you know, I've, I'm always thinking about preservation. Like, how do I, you know, I've lost hard drives yeah. and I've had to move work from floppies to SideQuest to Jazz to, to Zip to, to whatever, you know. I've always had to, like, you know, constantly be migrating my work to, to storage. And so when... Archiving. Yeah. COVID hit, I had just prior to that had been working on a space in, in New York called Zero Space. Mm. And it was four of us that started it. And um, it really was like this interactive uh, art museum sort of experience. And uh, when COVID hit, like all of a sudden all that's shut down and it was like, shit, you know, like, what, what do I do now? And really it was two people. It was, you know, Mike, people. I think, you know, he texted me or emailed me like, Hey, you should check out this whole NFT thing that's happening. And then I ended up like talking to my, a friend of my Brendan Dawes, who was also kind of navigating the space a little bit. Mm. And I remember like when I just started looking at, you know, NFTs, I started thinking about a lot of different things, like how to store work on the blockchain is one, you know, how to, how to store work and how to, um, like catalog things in a way that will have much more permanence than than maybe I've you know thought about, and then it becomes this idea about a state, you know. So like if I can take all this work that I'm sort of cataloging in a way, um, I can pass that key on to my daughter, and my daughter now can be the custodian of of this work after I have exited the, the great beyond here, right? And you know maybe she can you know continue to um, be the custodian of this work. You know, when I first looked at the blockchain, it, it, it made me really think about that, you know, I'm doing things with code and 
in a way, like all the work that I have been cataloging and preserving through recording of videos and creating still images is a disservice to the thing that I'm actually doing, which is writing software. And this software is able to create an infinite number of compositions. And so in a lot of ways, like I want to, I want people to see the infinite possibility of this thing, right? And so it comes down to like, hey, uh, you can open up Photoshop or Illustrator and you can start with a blank canvas and you can make a decision like, is it a, is it a perfect square? Is it a rectangle? Is it vertical? Is it horizontal? And then you start to make choices. You can say, okay, I'm gonna use this brush. I'm gonna use this tool. I'm gonna make this kind of mark. This mark has this kind of uh, uh, feeling to it. And right, so you're making all of those decisions. And after you're done, after you've executed all those decisions and you've made all those things, you're left with a visual representation of all of those decisions that you've made. And what I'm saying is, and what I realized is, I could program all that. And I could say, hey, you can make these kind of marks with these kind of colors, but not with these kind of colors. And these things don't like these things, so they're gonna repel from each other. But these two things do like each other, so they're gonna be attracted to each other. And then there's the system that gets dropped that starts to uh, meander, right? So I can continue to make all these things. And when I'm done, I now have this ability where I have programmed the eye of the beholder. And I can say, this thing thinks its job is to make a certain thing with a certain aesthetic output, but it can do that infinitely. And every time I say again, 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 this thing can run and run and run. And so I'm almost doing a disservice because I was like, I've spent 30 years writing all the software and the software is alive and can generate an infinite number of things for as long as you keep running them. And so the blockchain comes along and I say, okay, cool. Um, now I have this ability to actually put code on chain. So it's gotten closer to this, this purity of the thing that I'm doing, which is, hey, Ash, I'm going to put this thing on the blockchain. It's going to run for a certain period of time. And um, like a perfect example is I just closed a, a, a project called the Omega Code and it ran for seven days. And I had put in code where every seven days it switched up the colors so that you only had 24 hours to grab a certain colorway that would happen. And then at midnight, it would roll over into the next thing. So it then became this uh, opportunity that you could keep going back to the work over the course of seven days and asking it, um, what have you decided to do now? And it will say, I've decided to do this in orange. And you're like, cool. 24 hours goes by, I've decided to do this in purple now. I've decided to do this in white. So you you get to live with the work. So, uh, cool, at the end of the day, I check my wallet and I have money. <laughs> like, who, who, who cares? <laughs> who cares? Um, so money is not an importance to you on this thing? I, you know, I don't know. I, 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 again, I think it goes back to you know, I, I give talks at conferences and I look out across the landscape and there are people who definitely make like 10 times more money than me, but who's happier? I, I don't know. Um, I don't, I don't know if, if having a lot of money or not, it, uh, it probably, um, uh, makes me feel like, okay, I know I can pay my rent and there's some, there's some elimination of an, of anxiety about that, mm. but I just don't know if it's ever a concern. Like I, I just, you know, whether money happens or not is still not going to negate the fact that I'm going to make this work and I'm going to, I'm going to put it out there. Fuck. I've done that for 30 years. I've spent 30 years putting out work and just sort of yelling it to the world without there ever being a financial aspect mm. to it. In the terms of people collecting, yeah. you know, like I, I put stuff on Instagram, I put stuff on Twitter, I've had a personal website where, you know, I've constantly been saying, here's the weird shit I'm into. And it's I'm writing software and I can you can download that software and I will teach you how to do it and open sharing and cool. You're teaching me something and I'm teaching you something. And it just grows and grows and grows and grows. And the fact that someone says, here's money 
is nice, but it I don't. But I'm concerned about it being a driving factor. Yeah, you have to um, be because it can become all encompassing, scary, scary too. Yeah, I think creativity doesn't care if success exists or not. No. Doesn't care. It's relevant to creativity, but success will fuck up creativity. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So I just, you know, it's like the whole NFT thing. It's like, you know, now it's been a couple of years and, and now I have people like who maybe are just like on the outskirts are like, Oh, well, you know, the whole NFT thing like died down. And, and for me, it's like, has it? It hasn't. <laughs> and, and do, and do I care? And the, 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 the concept of like being able to put code on chain and do these things that gets close to the pure thing that I've always intended, which is writing software that generates something that you get to experience um, in that infinite way. Okay, cool. This thing runs for seven days. The last thing, uh, 925 people minted something. So 925 people, you know, gener generated uh, no pattern that's like any other right so it gets to it gets to be the thing that i've been talking about for for 30 years and people get to enjoy what i've been doing privately for the past 28 years before nft right and so uh and plus i never thought we would get yeah, here me and that's the truth of the yeah. matter and 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 again it you know i just like i remember when i was doing uh, work with programming rendered to PostScript, and I could open up that work inside of Illustrator. And I, I remember doing this show, I think in like 2007 or 2008 called Tropism. And uh, people would say, well, that's a really beautiful thing. And it's like, yeah, you can buy like a fine art print of it. There's only, this is a one of one. And I remember them being like, so explain how you made that thing. And it's like, well, I wrote a program that could generate an infinite number of compositions. Hmm. I chose this one out of rendering it thousands of times and I rendered it to PostScript. I opened it up into Illustrator and printed it on this, you know, 310 GSM fine, smooth, uh, fine art velvet. And, and that's it. And people would go, well, how do I know you're not going to print another one? Mm -hmm. Shit. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. So there was always this idea that like, oh, okay. You know, there isn't a way to collect digital art. There isn't a way we haven't figured out a way to to synthesize this this work that we're creating into something that that somebody could acquire or collect or think is valuable. And so I I'm being completely honest. I never thought it would happen in our lifetime. Right. You look at photography and go, wow, you know, photog photography took 70 years for it to be really embraced as actually an art form since its inception right it's a long time yeah. it's the internet though. I just it's thought, the internet that's doing it yeah the but activity. i just thought man digital art there's no way there's no way that you know, like people will think that this is fine art in my lifetime this will happen like well, well after i'm in the ground quite smart from all and of them too like the way it went <clears> down <throat> quite smart with the perspective of it you know the meta covid and oh i don't think it could have happened without covid yeah. i think if covid didn't happen mm. and we were all just sitting around <laughs> yeah I'm not sure. I'm not sure it would have ever happened the way that it did. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, I mean, COVID did a lot of interesting things. That's one of them. That's for sure. Yeah. So for me, it's this interesting thing. It's like, it's this idea of. Our first time we minted was uh, together, right? I think. Was it Christie's or did you mint yeah. prior to that? The sovereignty. Uh, no, I meant prior to mm. that. So I had been collaborating with Dead Mouse on a lot of projects, mm. and he was doing something with the guys at Super Rare. Mm. Okay. And Super Rare at the time had like a year long waiting list. Yeah. And and Joel basically uh, was talking with the people who ran Super Rare, and they're like, "Oh, you should look at my buddy, you know, Josh." And they just I onboarded me, like I jumped like this whole waiting Good. list. Yeah. And I remember like, okay, like I'll, this was before really art blocks. Mm. And so, um, art blocks was my first like code on chain, uh, project. Um, 
so super rare, I was like, oh, I'm recording videos. I'm recording these moments of time into this software that I render. And I'm making it very uh, known that like, hey, I'm writing a piece of software. Um, this is time-based media. I'm letting it run for hours and hours and hours. And I've only recorded like this. Um, I've, I've, I've edited this 15 seconds as a moment in time that I deem as something where something exciting happens after, you know, the thousands of hours that I've, you know, run it and, and rendered it. Mm. Uh, so that was the first. And then, yeah, then imagine like just navigating those waters and then all of a sudden it was our Christie's show. Mm. And I, I just remember like, again, another one of those goalpost moments, like, holy fuck, like really take time to understand what's just happened. <laughs> like, mm. like you just, you're showing work at Christie's with, <laughs> and you're not dead. And you're a digital artist. Yeah. <laughs> and you're a digital artist, yeah. right? Yeah. And, uh, so and a yeah, lot of it, just I think, like is just due to a... proximity to to people too. I think being in his periphery and you know having a relation. Oh, I would to, yeah. for sure. He was the kind. Yeah, hundred yeah, percent. I think yeah. you know, but it's it's fascinating. Like if you talk about the uh, not the everydays, but at, there was a time where, um, I was open sourcing all my work, which means I would make something, I would write something, and then I would share the mm -hmm. code. And that was really the bl blueprint for Mike, um, offering up, um, clips for free. Yeah. So he had this, this section where he would, uh, you know, make things in cinema 4d and then offer the source files that is directly from he's, I mean, at least that's what he's told yeah. me. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> You know, that, You're that was because inspiration. of something that I was doing. Yeah. Um, and so it was great. You know, it's really cool to have that connection with Mike. And then obviously I, I can't imagine uh, that whole event happening to anybody but Mike. I mean, he's yeah. perfect. He's the perfect entity for all of that to, to, to have happen. And yeah, just to brush elbows with that dude and and uh, and call him a friend and have him recommend us to be part of that show was 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 really beautiful. Yeah, it was a trip. Really, really beautiful. It also made the connected the three of us quite well too. We bonded through that experience because it was a it was a somewhat tumultuous thing because there was a lot going on, a lot of moving pieces, and it was a lot to take in. And it was like, hey, you guys existed in your little pure islands of sovereignty but here's this other thing called fine art and this is how this machine works and get ready for it and it's like fuck man like you gotta yeah. it's a real complicated human social experiment that that space <laughs> and who you and know is very important yeah it's funny it's me you and bradley g yeah. Monk. i mean we've obviously known each other for 20 some odd years yeah. But it's always been like at From a afar, periphery. Like yeah. we'd see each, yeah, we'd see each other at a conference and be like, "I respect you. You respect me. Cool." Like, uh, oh, love what you're doing. Love yeah. you. And I, I think that moment. I mean, I remember we started the the, the Trinity yeah. uh, discussions Discord. on uh, yeah. on Discord, yeah. and I just thought, you know, I think it was like a really beautiful moment because it really brought the three of us together because it was a shared, a shared experience, uh, experience where it's like, ah, oh, yeah. The three of us separately have done our own things, but we've done it for such a long time. And we're sort of arriving at this destination all together, sort of holding hands was, was, was really amazing. Yeah. And it's uh, very surreal. I appreciate you for that. Uh, Same. It's been great. It's been great not to just see you at a conference and be yeah. like, Oh yeah. Hey, what have you been up to? Oh, new film. Cool. You know, it's sure. like, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like it's, Oh, you're doing that still. Okay, cool. Interesting. Yeah. <laughs> well, okay. This has gotten me into like thinking and I mean, this is something we discussed a long time ago, me being a lover and a fan of history and also acknowledging it and understanding its importance. This is something I have obviously too. I was just got back from Basel, Miami. And this has like been in the forefront of my conversations with everybody that I interacted with was like, how can we, identify these things so that we can create new terms that would then appoint like making history applicable here. And I did a, a kind of like a test poll. I'm not very really good at these things, but I tested it on Twitter, which is a very noisy space as we all know. And I asked people, give me the ism of the current era, you know, tell me what ism are we in surrealism, 
uh, we, I mean, I'm just, this isn't what I was saying, but I was saying, look at these as examples, because this is something I discussed with you and Bradley and also Mike, I said, we cannot do this movement alone. We must unify and find the commonalities and the differences in order to dis dif differentiate and then find out where we sit in the history of this whole weird thing that we're doing. And people figured out, I think after a little bit of testing and stuff and trying things, some things out, there was a couple interesting things, but somebody, this is digitalism was the word that kind of arrived. What do you think of this? And we, cause our, I think there's isms inside this ism. This is what makes it different. Cause the way we, and the way we interact with digital art is totally different. I don't code and do programming. I do, I use a piece of software and the hardware and I attach those together and I just project and then I do it until I'm less frustrated. We have a different way of operating, but we still have similar outputs, but they're just a different process to get to it. But I don't know. I'm curious what you think, because it's been it's a, been a thought that's literally like to compounding in my head. How to identify mm. this? What is this thing? How can we express to the world the people in, in Colorado that said, oh, that's a sad thing. You don't paint. How can you go? No, actually, it's not because this is why, you know. Oh, shit. OK, I get that. Mm -hmm. How can you distill it? OK, yeah. so. Yeah, big so topic. I'm gonna say I'm gonna yeah, it's a big topic, and I'm gonna say some stuff because I think it's very dangerous. Yeah. Okay, which I agree. I, I agree, think, it is dangerous. I think it's very dangerous because uh, I'll get into why what the negative effects of thinking about that will be in a mm -hmm. second. But when we think about people who have done monumental contributions to society. I don't think they were ever thinking about history. Mm -hmm. And I don't think they were ever thinking about how uh, this is important of how they leave their legacy, right? And I'm even saying like when you even go farther back into Greek, Roman, right? Like they were just trying to get a better understanding of the inner workings of of universal mechanics. And I think that if they would have thought about history too much, which I don't know if, if it could, because there was, it was too hard to, to digest and disseminate that content. Mm. We now live in a, in a, in a, a time where it's very easy to digest and disseminate exactly everything that's going on at, at, the, at a precise moment. At okay? least try to. Why I think, why I think that's dangerous is because it, it would just cripple me. If I ever thought that every action and decision and thing that I embarked in was going to have some sort of impact about something in the future, then I would never make anything because I'd just be too crippled by the idea of defining this thing, solidifying this thing and navigating a path that, that I'm not, I don't, give a fuck. I don't care whether people like what I'm doing mm. <laughs> or care about what I'm doing or whether it has any place in history. And there is such a freedom to that because that means that uh, everything is possible. Mm. Every path is open to me because Nothing leads to consequence. Mm -hmm. And if I am too, uh, if I'm too caught up in the, what's going to, how are people going to perceive the thing that I've done over my lifetime? I will be crippled. Mm -hmm. I will be crippled with fear that, oh, do I want to, do I want to do this, this work at this time when, um, listen, listen, man. <laughs> I've been doing this for 30 years and I needed to eat. And there are things that I did uh, where I generated artwork for an Indian snack mix that got printed out on vinyl adhesive that was wrapped around a mini Cooper. <laughs> okay. Sure. Take that in. <laughs> yeah. well, Is that one of the most shining moments of my yeah. life? No. <laughs> right. Mm. But I, I needed to pay rent and I needed to eat. I needed to try it. I wanted to keep making this work. And, so, and I didn't go the route of academia, you know, and I probably could have. I, I probably could have gone the route of academia and I could have been a tenured professor somewhere and I would have been teaching this. And maybe, 
that lineage of the things that I've done over 30 years would have just been beautiful and pristine. Okay. But that didn't happen. That didn't happen. I, I did some shit that I'm not fucking really that jazzed about. Yeah. <laughs> and that has led me to like open up Instagram and like go, like I tell you, I did this. I went into Instagram and I scrolled all the way down to the bottom and I just started removing shit, archiving it because I thought, fuck, I don't want people to see the stupid shit that I said and these, these, this thing. So now I'm editing. I'm editing because I want to make sure that my, uh, my aura <laughs> emanates through history a certain way. How fucking crippling is that? I can't think about it. I can't think about it. I don't give a fuck. I don't care. There's only this moment. There's only now I'm having a great fucking time and I'm talking with you. And if I, if, if I get, too far ahead of me i it's just debilitating it's absolutely debilitating because i just i get uh drenched in fear of how people are are they gonna like me hmm. can't do it that's the howard work i can't the do howard it work must come in i can't i can't, yeah. I can't do it and, and yeah maybe it is maybe subconsciously yeah, it is. you gotta let him come in and, and just like, take control of that one History is for the historians to figure mm -hmm. out. And whether I'm a part of that conversation or not, it does not fucking matter. Well, I've realized in this space that you're as you're as you're only as relevant you're only as relevant as the people in which think that you're relevant. Which is scary. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Because it's all gatekeepers, yeah. you know. Look at look at what's happening right now with like Jerry Saltz, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. right? And and Rafik, yeah. like holy I have fuck! A lot to like think. as an observer, yeah. what a wild thing to like watch that it's happen. Wonderful, and and it's it's. I think it's wonderful. Is it wild? I think it's wonderful because it's I. Wild. This is how I look at it, and this is something that it took me a lot, a lot of time to process this myself and to see it, and another person to look at it objectively, is a critique's value. A critic's value is based on who they observe. Think about that. So the moment they say, mm -hmm. "I see you." And I'm going to critique mm -hmm. you. That means that I, that you have value enough for me to see what you're doing. And even if I don't like it, which is my job to, to look at the universe mm -hmm. and say, I don't like this thing. And I'm going to speak about it. That's your whole essence. Yeah. I know people will say, Oh, that's not, there's more than that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. I'm not trying to, let's not be, let's not fluff it up. When you're, when you're a critic, <laughs> I'm just going to be kind of a little harsh here. You're not contributing to the actual creation. You're just observing you know, and that's okay. Yeah. You're part of the ecosystem. Sure. Unfortunately, the academia and the value system, the value proposition, as I understand it, it, it caters to the people that are willing to critique. Because mm -hmm. the artist is like yourself, myself. I don't have time. I don't want to think about it. I'm too, it's going to fuck me up because the creativity doesn't need that. Creativity is the drug. It's right. the pure thing. You're, it's your job to critique. So when I saw that 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 dialogue going back and forth, I said, in my mind, because Rafiq is a friend, a casual friend. I don't know him deeply, but I know him well enough. And mm -hmm. I said, good for you, man. You're capturing the energy and attention of pretty high level people. And that's actually going to attribute to your legacy. If you can just hold strong and let the, 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 cause what he's doing potentially is saying, Hey, I think it's this. I'm going to throw some stones at you. I'm going to see how strong you are. Let's see if you can rise to the occasion and, and, and criticize me back or explain to me why I'm wrong. And that's the dialogue. And it's a beautiful place to be. But it doesn't always happen that way. But I, when I saw that, I said, I, I kind of distilled my thoughts down and I shared it. I didn't share it saying that specifically, but I shared it publicly. Mm -hmm. And I just said, you know, there's a saying that they see you. A criti a criti a tri a, it doesn't mean it's always bad. That means you're part of their ecosystem. And that's an important thing to, to think about. I uh, sat back and I was like, oh my God, it's, it's Rourke and Tooth. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, holy yeah. shit, it's happening. Yeah. It's right yeah, there. Yeah. That's why I like history. <laughs> you mentioned you know, like history in my mind. It doesn't have to be factual. That's a fictional book, but that's a, that's a, it's a book that was set a history moment in my life. So I look at it and go, oh, because we're pattern recognizing creatures, right? And we're constantly looking for the pattern and, and trying to find it in things. 
And uh, yeah, I thought that was really interesting. I wrote down some notes. I'm going to come back to all these things. You unloaded a ton and I want to talk about it. The reason why I think in my mind, which I agree, it becomes debilitating to foresee and think, I hope people like me. No, this is very dangerous. Expectations lead to odd predicaments, the truthful statement. And also the moment you put your happiness and joy in the hands of others, you're doomed. You're never going to be happy. You're going to be an unfilled shell of a human being. Never do that. But there is tremendous fucking noise in this space. Tremendous noise. Value is all over the place. No one knows who's who, what's happening, because nobody's doing the job to sit there and go, hey, this is how this history worked. It's because it's so new. And they're not going, well, who's Joshua? I don't know this. I'm going to buy this other thing. or This is more value. And it's, it's a fucking... It's a real problem because this is why we have these huge crashes that are happening because people are just throwing themselves into the unknown of lack of knowledge, basically. Speculation. Total speculation. And the NFT space is filled with a bunch of shilling and all these weird bad habits. And and, and, and unfortunately, a lot of Mm. negative human attributes have, have occurred and been displayed publicly. And I understand that. And that's a bad thing. Totally understandable. But there is a tremendous amount of noise. And if... We as the artists aren't sovereign to ourselves enough to say, hey, actually, this is who inspired me. This is where this came from. This is what makes sense to me. This is why this happened. Somebody else is going to do it and they're going to get it wrong. Mm -hmm. For example, I got introduced Mm -hmm. to some pretty interesting information when I was at a party. I was at Pablo's house and I met a gentleman. I forget his name. I'm horrible with names. If you're listening to this, I'm sorry. You're awesome. He explained to me that blockchain was actually supposed to be called time chain. Have you heard this? Okay, well, this is, you're going to love this. So in the original code of blockchain, it was, it said time chain. And the editor or the author that was writing about it just called it blockchain. But if you understand the code, it actually should be called time chain because it's more fitting to what it actually is. It's, it's capturing time and a moment that's of occurrence. Mm-hmm. It's time. But the author timed it, named it blockchain, which then blockchain. took fire. And then the history was written. And then we all call it blockchain. It's not the right thing. A la noise. This is why I'm saying, and this is why I've been discussing it. And I think it's important for us to discuss as much as I hate the idea of being like, but somebody had to say, hey, you know what? Photography came and now it's no longer important to be a painter of realism. So let's make surrealism or impressionism Mm -hmm. this is what makes us different and this is why we're important or whatever it might be i don't think that's necessarily always the artist connection Uh, uh, francis uh, uh, bacon for example i researched him a little bit during college and then just on my own he was somewhat well known as i understood and i could be wrong with all these things but he eventually became very well known because a, a certain editor author curator had done these beautiful interviews with him on BBC, exposed him to the world. He became the tortured artist of the day, became a huge success. And now we're talking about him. That's how relevant he is. All these years later, still to be discussed. See the value there? That's what I was saying about the Jerry thing. You're only as valuable as the other part of this ecosystem exists. And since now we're no longer alone on our own islands, making art for the sake of art, We're now attached to blockchain, non-fungible technology, all of these things. I think it's important for us to take ownership and say, hey, hold on here. We need to start discussing this because it's it's, it's kind of important. It's at least important to me. I know it's important to you to some degree, Mm -hmm. but it's just something I've been really trying to get down to. And the more I ask, the more it gets more complicated, the more I realize, oh, it's like, it's almost like looking at a fractal. It's like, okay, I see it's like a starfish. Oh shit. Now it's turning into like a cloud formation. I'm like, oh shit. And I start to realize how different it is. But there is commonality. The one rooted commonality that I understand it to be is that for me personally is I use hardware and software to make the art. I can't do it without those. The machine is my synthesizing partner. That's the same thing for you too. You use a hardware and software. This is the core binary thing. I'm just 
So are we in machinism? I asked about that too. And then somebody mentioned some random thing that that's already been taken and it's been, it's like, and then, and, and, and these, <laughs> really? it's totally fucked. It's crazy. Um, but I think we're not necessarily, I don't think outside of our own ability to make art are kind of, do we have the, the place to, to kind of rap on this, but it's something that should be discussed. At least for me, I know it is because I mean, people are like, it's beeponism. And I'm like, well, Beeple is definitely a part of this, but you need, you got to look broader and wider. I think sure. you do. Or I could be wrong. Maybe it is. There is an ism inside this ism that is Beepleism, you know? <laughs> it, that's just when it starts to get fractured. He he would hate this, by yeah, the Of way. course he would. <laughs> yeah, because he doesn't want that shit. He also, like you and me, we it makes us uncomfortable to to think about does our art have impact? I think we want it to have the right impact and the positive impact. But part of us also is like, I don't really give a fuck if you get this or not. This is not my job. My job is just to synthesize, to sit and process and, and do it. Yeah. That's a true artist endeavor. But as we enter, this is why I mentioned this is because if you're doing NFTs and you're not into money, I think it's, you're lying to yourself. There's the money component is, definitely a part of it there's definitely the technology which is beautiful but money is also it for me it is it's like money is super well, important yeah I'm, i maybe i maybe downplayed it a little bit but i mean it's it, listen for 30 years i've had to do other things to make money so that i could buy food mm. you know and it, but the idea of like oh i'm just going to make these weird things personally and i can still gain financially mm. from it H how would i do that well, in the past, we used to sell posters. Yeah. So I would like, you know, I'd make artwork, you know, I'd print them out and I would ship them, you know, from my barn to your barn. And I would sell things for like, you know, 10 bucks, 20 bucks, right? Because I, I would always like, can I make a living singing with this voice that I want to sing with? And I've had to do other things in order to, uh, to survive, right? To live. And, you know, some years I made $100,000. Some years I made $10,000, like literally, uh, you know, I, there's been great years and then there's been years I've done absolutely mm -hmm. nothing. And, you know, when NFTs happened, maybe I got a little closer to, Hey, you can make this, you know, weird stuff without having to, to, uh, collaborate with a brand and, and make a thing for a brand. It can just be that pure voice expression that you want to do without it having to being tied to something to sell some sort of product. Yeah. Well, your um, work then turns into currency. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and somebody says so, to you, says, Hey, I like what you fuck with here. I'm going to invest in you and what you're doing. I'm going to turn right. my money into you and your currency. I'm going to bet on you. Yeah, but there's a lot, but there's a lot of ways to do that now. Sure. I mean, you could start a Patreon. You don't have to do NFTs. You could just ha have a kind subscription of, Patreon though. thing, or though. you know, you could do a TikTok, and if it goes viral, you could get paid by uh, that shit. I mean, there's a pro a lot of different yeah. ways that you could that you could make. I'm money just talking about the fine art NFTs, world. It's a little but, different, I think, and that's uh, that's who oh, invests sure. in you and what they what that means to them, and 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 that yeah. whole kind of connection to that legacy. But but here's not the thing: not beholden is, to collectors either. It's very dangerous because you're like, you know, just like I wasn't sure. loyal to brands, I'm not loyal to that either. But I have, but I am connected. It's like, okay, well, I want to make sure that yeah. we're all succeeding. You know, that's important. Mm. <laughs> we're heading in the right direction. So let's <laughs> let's have this quick conversation about like, okay, I'm in school at Pratt, and um, I've decided to take a couple of classes inside of communication design. Uh, and they used Max, and I couldn't afford Max. And um, th there was so software like Photoshop and Illustrator, and I certainly couldn't afford Photoshop and Illustrator. So I learned how to crack. I, I learned sites that would sell the cracked software, and so that I could I could pay for the software without actually owning you know the 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 license. It was so expensive it. back then, and, too. Oh, so expensive! Like... And here's the cool thing: is you would run this crack software, and in the beginning there'd be the demo scene. There'd be somebody who had written a program yeah. that was almost like graffiti yeah. uh, that was, they would tag <laughs> the startup of the software to let you know that this was cracked by, you know, the, the cracker game. <laughs> it was the demo scene. It was the demo yeah. scene. 
And I didn't know anything about the demo scene. And I just remember, I remember like starting up Photoshop Illustrator and seeing these kind of like visuals. I didn't know like that's what it was called. Through. I know what this is. It's called the demo scene. That, yeah. yeah. So, so it's like, you know, these uh, shaders of like, balls bouncing through mountains and rippled oceans and like cracked by and i remember seeing that thinking like oh this is beautiful like it's like graf digitally graffiti tagging you know the software before i mm. ran it yeah. right now why didn't i know about the demo scene i didn't know about the demo scene because this is kind of like the pre-internet i was downloading this software off of bbs's this is kind of like a 94 ish 95 ish is kind of before the the internet was like archiving and recording the happenings of everyday people, mm -hmm. right? It's not until maybe 20 years later that I learn about Vera Molnar, who in the 60s was writing software with like Fortran, I I think, and was like actually doing programs that were plotting, like she was using a plotter to like make artwork that we that like we're making mm -hmm. today. So you so you start to look at history and say, well, why didn't we talk about these people? Well, we didn't talk about these people because they existed in these very niche pocket mm. that happened before the internet. And so there wasn't a good documentation and cataloging and describing of what this work was and what these people were mm. doing. Okay? So... 95 comes around and we we sort of get the internet in a really explosive way and we have been slowly sort of dark documenting and archiving the happenings of of everything you know and so in a lot of ways like I now have been recording my sort of digital existence on the internet since 1995 and you know I joined Twitter in 2007 mm -hmm. yeah. you know uh, and there's like a permanent record of. I deleted my Twitter when the world was going dumpster oh, fire. Yeah, really? I didn't like the idea that people were weaponizing information against you, and I th and I thought to myself, mm -hmm. this is not the way of a free society. What you're, what people are doing is they're impeaching, they're they're impeding on the idea of free speech. People are saying you can't say that. It's like fuck you, I can't say that. Mm -hmm. This is my fucking right, man. Mm. <laughs> but what I can mm. do is I can take responsibility and you should treat me with some humility and understand we, we're flawed creatures and we go through this life bouncing around. But this hysteria now yeah. is absolutely bullshit. It's, it's totally, I get why it's happening, but it's just really sad to see my fellow human minds just completely unraveling underneath just this mm. chaos noise. Yeah. <laughs> But let's look at, you know, the past 20 sure. years, you've done interviews, oh, you've it's done there. talks, yeah, yeah. like there is a record sure. of, of the podcast you is know, a, what you've been trying stamp. to. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. So I, I don't. So cool. I'm not worried about yeah. that shit. That's good. I'm, I, I mean, don't. I, let me worry about it then. I I've guess, said some, and I'll come I've, to you with I've some thoughts. Some <laughs> absolutely dumb things. As you, you should, know, said though, some right? Your things. style yeah, and who I mean, you are just, is based on your flaws, listen, you know? I gave a talk at TED in 2005 mm. and no one would know it because my video is not online because I said some really stupid <laughs> shit. <laughs> yeah. I think I said fuck like 55 million times in 15 minutes. But isn't that beautiful though? Like, <laughs> to me, know? I see that as being beautiful oh. because it's like, okay, for example, let's look at... I think at one point I took my shirt off <laughs> and I was just in like a tank top, you know, and... Fucking... Well, that's the point of it, though, you know? Like, to... Just absurd. Well, Absolutely absurd. Let's say, like, our friend, our common friend, Bradley. We've seen variations of him. I, there's... Now there's a different variation of him. I'm just using him as an example because we brought it up earlier, and I, I know he's going to listen to this, so... Love you, baby. Don't don't be insecure. But monkey. Yeah, monkey, monkey pants. And even he goes, man, there's I can't do public. I can't speak like I used to. And to me, that hurts to me because that means and I don't know if he's saying this deliberately, but we're talking about how much we've changed and how much society has changed. And to me, that yeah. that, that bothers me and, and upsets me because I'm not getting the true source. I want the true you. I want it. Even if it's flawed, I want to mm. I want to be insulted by you, and I want to feel that, and I want to feel enraged by you, and I also want to feel that's beautiful, and I also want to feel that. That's just me, though. But I'm also willing to ex 
admit that I don't know shit. You don't know shit. Mm -hmm. We're just trying to navigate, you know? That's the beautiful thing. But anyways, that's a tangential thing. And that's a whole societal thing. That's a real fucking problem. Because like, even, I mean, we have young daughters. Well, somewhat young. They're young women now. But like, and the, mm -hmm. the I mean, we openly talk about everything. Because this is how I like to operate. I don't like to, it's just why. And I've had so many interesting, deep conversations with my daughter about these kind of things. It's just like, and her telling me, oh, you can't say that. I'm like, but I can. This is the thing. I can, but it, it comes with responsibility. But I have to live with the consequences. Yeah, yeah. and then weaponizing it. If if the consequences, yeah. yeah. And I right. hate the idea sure. of like, that was one of the big motivators behind the last series of work I was doing is like people weaponizing past data as if it's you today. And it's such a, it's such a, mm. it's such a lack of, it's it almost like I started rereading like 1984. I think that's what it is. Yeah. I'm so bad with mm. names. You know, the common book, you know? And I was like, man, yeah. we're like fucking falling at, face forward into this shit. It's like, can we not? Can we just celebrate we're all different and be like, that's fucking cool? Whatever. I don't have to love everything. This is not, the universe isn't there for me to love it, you know? It's there for me to look at it, observe it, and then deal with it. <laughs> Flow right. with it or not. But anyways, that's a whole tangential thought. And not worthy of us talking about it anymore. <laughs> we'll wrap it up here in a sec. And we have to do more of these if you're up for it. Because I think we should really, at least in my mind, there's not enough time in the day to really try to distill this down. I love that we have complete different looks at this. Because for me, I'm like, how can we fucking distill this? Because I want your work and all my friends' work to be valued as I think it should be. But here's like, especially in, in generative art, there's actually some really cool stuff happening. There, there is a, a group of people called La Random that are really trying to tell the story of, of generative art and, and its history. And I think that is a byproduct of, of NFTs and oh, happening. Yeah. Uh, mostly to try to inform like, hey, these have been players in the space and here's mm -hmm. why, you know. This this woman started doing this in the 1960s. Manfred you know, Moore, I just got started, inspired. I didn't. I never even yeah. heard of him, and then to, I got introduced yeah. at Basel, and I was like, "Fucking amazing! Yeah, so cool. One of us. Yeah, that guy's one of us. Yeah, one, one of, of us. us. Yeah. yeah, one of us. And how could and I be so a digital artist trying... and not know this person? Yeah, I know. Well, and so this group, La Random, they're they're on Twitter, and and they're running this website as well as collecting mm. work. So. You know, they're, they're collectors as well as sort of archiving like what's happening in the space. And they've done some really beautiful interviews with a bunch of people. Um, and I think that is a byproduct of, um, you know, early NFT craze. I think people were just throwing buckets of money at, at anything, yeah. Well, uh, yeah. but not necessarily knowing like, is this important? And then I, I even remember having a conversation with Jehan whom, yeah. you know, shout I think out to both collected our, shout out to Jan. he's both collected yeah. our work, but you know, he made this one thing that really resonated. He said this one thing that really resonated with me is, is um, we're so early. Like a lot of the traditional art collectors aren't even looking at the NFC yeah, space even, yeah. because they can't, they can't discern uh, the difference between what's just hype and what's, you know, I can't blame that historically important. Yeah. And so, um, I think it's just going to take some time. I know for, especially for generative art, this group La Random is really doing a beautiful job of just cataloging like what's been happening in generative art and that, and that sort of vivid history, as well as commissioning and collecting mm. the work, which I think is really beautiful. Good and, for them. And God knows, you know, at some point, you know, um, I'm sure they'll have a museum approach them because they're doing such a good Archiving job telling this, this yeah. story. Archiving and and just making sure that the story is is getting mm, told. That's good. Um, in a in a way from from the people um that are actually doing mm. it. So, mm. um, yeah. cool. I will let that happen, but I can't. Yeah. I can't. It's not for you then. I, yeah. I can't. I can't think about. Do I have a place mm. in it? You know, it's just. It, well, it's, it's not too, really your say. For me, it's, really, it's it's too debilitating. Yeah. I can't. You know, it's it's then then the, the windows of possibility start closing because I, I become too aware. Mm. 
and I don't want to be yeah. that way. I I just you know I want to I want to keep things that everything is possible. So I'm still going to say some dumb shit and do as you dumb should. Things. It's your it's your fucking <laughs> it's yourself. You know. Yeah, you know we're we're just stupid creatures trying to figure it out, failing. Through so it. I. I had to look this up, but I just, you know, when all this stuff was going on with Rafik and, and Jerry, I, I just, I, I just sent him to he, Mr. Rourke, we're alone here. Why don't you tell me what you think of me? And then I highlighted in any words you wish, no one will hear us work, but I don't think of you. <laughs> so good. <laughs> and I just thought that's, you yeah. know, that, that freedom of just not being affected <laughs> and the ability to say this this resonates my being and it doesn't matter whether there are critics or there's an audience. Mm -hmm. I don't even think there needs to be an audience. Um, if that's something that, that you're into. If you um, want to be super ultra vacuum pure and doesn't need to oftentimes for me personally, my own sanity, sometimes I just make stuff for myself because I need to. And I, I have an artist date, basically a date with myself and art. And I just, full on pour myself into the experience and it's like all right this is why i fucking do this yeah, yeah i don't sure. do this to to make money or i don't do it for that i do it's, it for, yeah it's prayer it's yes. meditation yeah. it's something it's that has to exist but there's no there's no audience yeah. i mean i'm i'm the active participant but it does there doesn't need to be an yeah. audience yeah um anyway it's it's uh, yeah i can't it's too okay it's good to know yeah, I won't ask you about it's it, but thing. maybe I'll ask you questions <laughs> down the road. <laughs> but that is, there, there's a there's key differentiators, you know, like you have these key players, and I think a lot of the ones that potentially get the most energy and clout and noise around them is just simply based on who's invested in their currency, you know, and that's a really interesting thing. It's like you're just transferring energy, and who's speaking about what. And it's just, it's just fascinating. The, the, the amount of conversations I had just this at Miami, I was so thankful I was there and so happy I was there to just be ingratiated by the company in which I had, which is like very wealthy people and very smart programmers and like people that have been in the tech space since like before me and like asking them this, mm -hmm. these paradigm questions, like, where are we here? What is this? What can we do to be better? And this is the last question I'm going to ask you of this podcast is what do you want to see in this space that would make you happy, the happiest? Oh, shit. <laughs> Don't mess up, Josh. Jesus Christ. I, let me throw you this softball. <laughs> right to your face. Oh, my God. <laughs> uh... It doesn't have to be big. Just like, what do you want to see when you look at this space and go like, yeah, this is making me happy. I'm happy this is happening. You know, I think this is for me, uh, but this is something that I've just always engaged in because I've seen the value in it, which is, um, is just truth and open sharing. Um, I, you know, I started open socialing my work like super, super early because I saw value in and giving and receiving knowledge. And what I found is, is that if I was willing to say, um, I don't want to hoard this, I don't want to hide yeah. this, and it's probably not perfect, and it's probably flawed, and maybe my math is wrong, but it's an idea. And if I take that idea and I give it away, um, there's a couple of things that happen. Um, one is, is, is that people who are under your skill level are going to learn something. And then they're going to be able to um, use that thing, navigate that thing and embrace that tool in order to help discover their voice. Then there are people who are going to take that thing and they're smarter than you and they're going to add on to it and give it back mm -hmm. to you. And so I would often open source a piece of work and I would get that open source work back like 50 times. And with people who saying, hey, um, you know, those 10 lines of code that you wrote? Well, um, you could actually use Modulo and put this down into one line of code. And I'd like, oh, OK. So now I, I get into like refining that thing so that I get better. 
And then you open it up to uh, people who are going to add their own spices and ingredients. And then you get that back and like, oh, I never would have thought to do that. Or I never would have thought to tackle that problem that way or open up that door to creativity that could provide that certain thing. And so I think the problem with a lot of our space is this hoarding. This this is mine, and I've I figured this thing out, and it's me, and I'm too crippled to let it go. Because I don't because um what if somebody takes it and does it better than me? And then then who am I and where am I? And so, you know, I immediately saw this value in the internet very early because I didn't know PCs, Windows machines, and I couldn't afford Macs. And so my first computer was mm-hmm. Linux. It was because, you know, you could buy a $30 book and the uh, the CD-ROM with the code was, awesome. <laughs> was at the back the of the book. Synology's run off Linux. And so, yeah. 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 And so there was this like whole idea of like, oh, I got a new sound card. I put that sound card into my Linux machine and now the sound doesn't work. Oh, I can go on this forum where somebody's written a driver that I can add and recompile the kernel so that the sound. So there's this free exchange of ideas of knowledge that only benefits us all. And so I would hope, you know, fuck, we're talking about legacy again. You know, I would hope that my legacy was that, you know, for 30 years, I tried to share as much as I could upon this community for the people who will supersede me, right? And, you know, to get those moments where people come up to me and say, hey, I saw your work when I was in high school and it had a profound effect on me that I, you know, I took this career path, whether it was completely mirrored to what I did or just 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 di- digital art. It didn't have to That's necessarily how it was for me. be generative yeah. art, yeah. you know? Uh, I think that's what I would hope. Mm. I would hope that um and i think you talked about this even just sort of spiritually or politically everyone is so siloed right yeah. now that i i feel like this stream of creativity and information sharing in a lot of ways is getting pocketed yeah, it's really unfortunate and and i find it i do it myself just, too as you're saying that i'm critiquing myself and asking myself am i doing that well, too yeah. well here's here's a perfect here's a perfect example um, obviously I'm doing code on chain and I ended up pinging, uh, this guy. And I just said, should I, should I be minifying my code? And now let me explain what that is, is I can write a bunch of code that's maybe like 3000 lines long and it has comments and it has, um, you know, I could comment my work and tell, Hey, this function is doing this. And this thing is doing that. And this is what this thing is doing. And then there's hard returns and there's tabs and there's spaces. I can take that code and I can actually run it through another program that removes all that, removes all the commenting, removes all the hard returns, removes all the spaces so that everything is just one huge block, compressed, squeezed, so that it's almost impossible to read. And I said, should I be minifying my code? And this one guy said, you know, I think it's really beautiful if you don't minify your code because you're just, you're peeling back the curtain and you're letting people who, if they want to, can pop open the hood and just, and look at the Mm -hmm. engine. They can pop open the hood and, and say, here's the thing that makes this thing do what it does, how fast it goes, how the sound it makes, the vibration that it like you're you're it that's beautiful, and you can buy a car and never open the hood, and you don't even need to know what's under the hood now, right? I can buy a car, I can never pop the hood of the car, oh, it's got to be serviced, I gotta go get the car serviced and 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 that whole world can be hidden from you. And the car will still work. Or if there is a desire, there is the ability to push that button, pop open the hood, 
and look at the thing that's underneath that makes that thing. And so I said, oh, shit, well, I, I don't think I'm ever going to minify my code again. I don't think I'm going to do that because why, why would I want to hide that thing that makes the thing? And so now in all the projects that I've been doing on chain, I've actually been not minifying my code and just showing the beauty of, of this thing that I've written that creates the thing that you're, that you're, that you're seeing. And I think that's important. I think it's important for me to leave, um, those little brushstrokes of my life and make them so that if people want to consume and digest that content, that it, that it's there. Um, and so I, yeah, I think for me, my desire is, uh, is transparency and communication and not being so gripped by fear that I can take this thing and share it with mm. others. Um, yeah, it's high level. I love that. We're going to end on that because it's a beautiful thought and it's a beautiful desire. And we're at like three yeah, hours. I said two hours. <laughs> yeah, it's okay though. You no, know, at the very beginning, you're like, yeah, usually these are about an hour. And I was like, <laughs> well, I try I to, we're but be, yeah, yeah. I was like, I think we're going to be talking yeah, for two hours. Three. Nope. Yeah. <laughs> Which is beautiful. But I, I do love that. I think that's a wonderful way for us to, to, to end this as well, just for now and come back to it at another time and do another episode. But the idea of, of giving and being open and free, it, it creates a, it cultivates an environment of, of, um, it's, it's a good thing. I think it's important. I don't think humanity has ever done super well by hoarding and not exchanging. I think we've never had, there's probably some instances in our history, but I don't think it's ever been beneficial to us to not. So I love that. Thank yeah. you, Joshua. Appreciate you. And you know. thank you. And I would say if, if you're, if you've made it this far, if you've listened to the whole thing, I think that's the that's magical <laughs> because you've, You've uh, you've set out three hours of your life to uh, to listen to two people who are batshit crazy. <laughs> yes, <laughs> and nothing we've said should be listened to. <laughs> That's accurate too. <laughs> don't take don't take any of my advice. <laughs> Everything I said is painful <laughs> yeah. and only leads to further misery. <laughs> Pretty much. What did you say? Addiction and handicap. So the two things. Yeah. 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 Disability. Addiction disability, and disability. Right, yeah. <laughs> love it. Ash, man, it's always a pleasure. I, I love you to pieces. And, you, uh, and you know, the, 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 the reason why I love you is, 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 is there's just this commitment to truth. Right. And it's, and it's, and if you just get out of the way, if you just get the fuck out of the way, then 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 things happen. And it's this it's this it's this remarkable thing where it's like I realized like my worst enemy was myself because I would constantly put these obstacles in front yeah. of myself like I can't do this or I can't get there or I can't be Ash Thorpe. Right. And in a way, it's like by doing that, I've solidified yeah. I've solidified that I will never achieve that because I've already said that I could, that I can't. And so, you know, what I appreciate about you and a lot of other people in this space is that if you just get the fuck out of your own way, then some really beautiful things happen because it just, the, the, the landscape of, of possibility and beauty opens up because you can go there. And you're one of those people. You're one of those people that just says, I'm going to do some shit. And it, it might make you uncomfortable and it might make you feel a certain way, but this is the truth that I, uh, that I need to live in. And I'm not going to tell you about it. I'm going to, and I remember I came up to you and I'm like, man, I got some fucking questions. Like that guy in the bathtub, like what is, what is this? Is that, is, is it <laughs> right? And and there's this moment where my uh, my experience is so unique to me that it doesn't matter what mm -hmm. the truth is. Yeah. And you're you're living your own truth, and you're telling this this story that you need to tell, and then it lives, it lives in others, and it it teleports others to their own arrived experiences. <laughs> 
And that's the beauty. That's the beauty <laughs> of you, mother. That's the beauty of you, motherfucker. <laughs> Um, this Thank has you, been brother. great. I appreciate um, that. It's great let's, kind of you. let's do this again and we'll, we'll make it another Absolutely. three hours. My dog is going ape shit out there. I gotta go take care of him. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate the kind words and, and you for t- sharing your life with us and being so vulnerable and, and opening up and we're going to do another one. Okay. Big love. <laughs> Bye.